like to welcome everybody to this October 8th Dallas County School Board work session. The agenda has been posted to our webpage for those of you that are following online. What I don't have on that agenda, um, since we last met, we lost a very important person in this community. It was a husband, father, community leader, a school board member, a friend, a lover of children in this community, and just generally will be very well missed. Marion Ballard <clears throat> has since gone to be with the Lord since we last met, and want to take a few minutes to um, just take a moment of silence and just remember not just what a tremendous board member he was, but also tremendous support for this community. So everybody just join us for a moment of silence. everybody on the call or on the virtual page can see the amount of staff we have in this room but we have a pretty much a member from each part of our department that is crucial to running the school system from transportation to craft cafeteria to the educational piece to special education to our, our nurses <clears throat> uh, we're going to be utilizing that group of expertise as we have our discussion about how we intend to go back to school and when we can do that and all the logistics that follow that. Before we get to that, we have a few quick things that the board needed to discuss. Um, Dr. Arbogast, when last we met, we were still trying to understand the details related to the elementary school boilers and we had had some people come in and tear those down. They, they, we had them come in. Uh, they came in, tore them down, uh, did some uh, uh, investigations on them, uh, research, uh, uh, some evaluations of them, um, and they have provided information back to us through John Ross. Um, it's, it's about five thousand dollars to do some work on on the boilers throughout our buildings, um, with valves and and insulation and that type of stuff to to replace. Um, he's going to be here at two o'clock. Um, so he can share additional information uh, a little bit better than I can on, on exact work that's going to be done um, and then answer the questions about, I think that you asked me uh, yesterday about uh, Nares Elementary and Macy's uh, boilers as well. Is the board okay with tabling that until John Ross can get here? Okay. Dr. Rogas, any updates on concerns we received about our wireless coverage and how this color distribution we, we, we've gotten the cards out, uh, the, uh, the T-Mobile cards have gotten out. Um, if there has been an issue with the T-Mobile card, they've notified us and we're working with, again, with John and the county um, uh, to see if we can secure Verizon wireless cards that, that should work in those, in those areas. Um, so we're, we're still in the process. I'm waiting on the paperwork uh, to sign uh, to, to get, that, get those uh, purchased. And again, no matter what we end up doing, at any moment's notice, the board realizes that we have to be ready for worst case, and that would be that wireless would be the only way we'd be able to reach our children. So we will continue to make sure that is a priority. Any other board members received any concerns about that from their representative areas or any questions that you want to ask about that right now? When do you hope, like the wireless, because I know we do still have others who do not have internet? I, t I talked to John, I will say, at the end of last week, early this week, uh, about Verizon, uh, but I've not gotten the paperwork from them yet. Um, they were in the process of working through that. Uh, have you heard anything? Yeah, the last I heard that they were, <clears throat> I think they were with maybe about the end of the week or maybe last week. But as soon as I get the paperwork, we'll, we'll, we'll sign it so we can start getting them, get them ordered and get them here so we can get them out. 
Okay, Dr. Arbogast, unless any of the students have anything else before we move to the back to school update, I will turn that over. That, that might be for the legal counsel. Oh, yes. One last thing that the legal counsel, RMP, Dr. Arbogast, was any update on? That, that went out uh, last week, I believe it was, last Monday, Tuesday. Um, comes back, I think, the 16th or 18th. Next week. Next week sometime. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, that has gone out, okay. and we have, and I have communicated with uh, uh, Sands Anderson, and they are t for temporary, in between the retirement and securing the new one, they are working with us. Any other questions? One last thing, Dr. Arby asked the, the, the GEA letter, Ms. Lang, was, was the intention that we share that at this meeting. So they requested in, in, the, in place of someone attending. Yes. And we read this. Mm -hmm. Does the board want that before <coughs> we do this? Is there preference on that? That'd be fine. Well, then, then give me a second then. You're already into that, Dr. Arby, yes, we can. Yeah, but I don't know how to get out. That's the problem. They can hear you, but they just can't see you. Well, you go, just go ahead with your, your activities. We'll maybe end with this and okay. end up addressing some of the things that you talk about. Okay. I'll, I'll try to get it back out here in a little while. Um, Based on the conversation we had at the last board meeting, um, and I shared a little bit of this yesterday with you all, um, we took what we thought, what I, what I, uh, let me say, I took what I thought the charge was from the board, and that was for us to gather information based on uh, pre-K through seventh grade enrollment. Uh, because, and you already mentioned, we have a lot of our staff here with us. The purpose of having them here is because, as you mentioned, this does any decision that's made will touch each of the departments. It will touch transportation, it will touch cafeteria, it will touch special ed, it will touch our uh, head nursing and, and uh, instructional. So we need it. I mean, everybody here has put information into this presentation today for your benefit. So we we surveyed, we get we gathered information from parents through Canvas, pre K through seven. We, serve, we gathered information from staff members. We gathered information from cafeteria. We gathered information from transportation. All that's gonna be in here today. Um, talking to a couple of you before, before the meeting started, we, we realized the challenge that this that lies ahead of us with this. Because the easiest thing for us to do, we've said it all along, the easiest thing is to bring everybody back. That's the easiest thing. But that's not, that, that's not the right thing. Because we can't, in this time, we can't do that right now because of the current situation. And, and meet the requirements that we have to have with physical distancing and our mitigation strategies. So what the hope is today is, uh, we're going to share information with you. We've got a bunch of different topics. Uh, as I shared the charge that we thought was from the board, you're, you've asked about Canvas. We're going to share a little bit of information about Canvas training, what, what occurred. Have updated, some health, updated health department information, cafeteria information, transportation, current enrollment information, which, which is important. Some of our mitigation strategies, that continues to be important. And the process that we did, uh, that we conducted for our surveys, parents, teachers, etc. And then we have some this some summary uh, summary of the data. And then we'll we'll have any any and, and please stop us if you got questions. When everybody comes up there, please stop because each each person is going to come up and, and share information with you. If you have a concern, you have a question, stop us. But at the end, we'll we'll need to have a conversation and a discussion about the direction that we need to go. So with that, 
I'm going to turn it over and let uh, Paula talk about uh, the Canvas uh, training that, that's been conducted or that information has gone out um, so, you, so you can see that information. Hello. You hear me good? <laughs> All right. We thought, well, I can't, this is going to be difficult. I'll stand away from you. Um, we just wanted to provide you a timeline and kind of, you know, what exactly happened with Canvas as we got things going with teachers and um, going with our system. So, um, Dr. Pants, if you could, if you already have it, sorry. We provided you with um, just some dates and some pretty much a timeline of how we um, got all of this information out to teachers. So if you see um, in June of 2020, we started the implementation process with Giles County Public Schools, with PowerSchool and with Canvas. That was all technology. That was um, Michelle Lucas, myself, Tricia, working with PowerSchool, working with Canvas, getting our systems set up, getting teacher accounts set up, getting student accounts set up, and all of that was technology. So once we felt that we were comfortable um, and that teachers did actually have access, they, this is a single sign-on so that they go in through their account that they already have um, through Google. They can scroll down, they can find the Canvas app, and they had um, kind of like a sandbox account that they could go in and look around, see what it was all about. Did not have student information in it yet, did not have their classes in it yet because we were still setting that up. Um, but they did have an opportunity to go in and look at it, play around with it, and that's what a sandbox account is. It's where you go and play. Um, so on July 1st of 2020, um, I gave webinars. Um, there was several videos that we shared with teachers where they could go in and look around um, in Canvas to see how it worked, um, see how things were going. And I know Lisa has talked with you, you know, about this before. This was brand new to, to Virginia. They had, you know, about 132 school divisions that they were trying to get implemented. Uh, DOE wasn't actually going to push this out for probably another six months to a year. Um, but with the COVID restrictions coming and they knew school divisions were going to need online resources, they went ahead and pushed this out. So, you know, we're on their timeline as well with things that they're setting up and they're working with 132 school divisions in Virginia trying to get all of this set up. So once we felt comfortable that they, you know, they, they actually had something to go in and look at, that's when we started providing uh, resources and information. Our first actual training you can see was on July 27th. Um, this was two half day sessions. Um, teachers uh, participated um, virtually um, at their schools. Um, I think they were very overwhelmed. You can imagine a teacher trying to get ready for their for all of their students to come back on a regular year, and then we're throwing, you're also going to have to teach virtually. So yeah, they were very overwhelmed. And and you know, I'm sure that you heard a lot about that, as we did too. Um, but I will say on a positive note, as we went forward and with all of the trainings and all the resources that we've provided to teachers. Things, I mean, they have excellent pages. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at them. We've looked at some of them. I mean, they're just blowing us away with what they're putting out there on their Canvas pages. They're working very hard. And I know that they're very stressed about it because they have in-person students as well as virtual students. And it, yeah, it's very overwhelming, but they're getting it. And, and they're doing very well with it, actually. We're very pleased with what we see. And that's why they're saying the easiest thing to do is to bring everybody back. That's, that's what they keep saying. Yeah, that's the easy thing. Yeah. Yeah. But I think I think teachers are, are getting more comfortable with it. I mean, when you throw something at anybody, I mean, I was overwhelmed with it. It was all new to us as well. And we were getting questions from teachers that we couldn't answer because we weren't familiar with the program. So I think we're all kind of calming down now and we're getting used to it and we're, you know, we're learning how to use the program. So I think that's why you're hearing now, we're good, we're, we're, we're getting it and, and we're good with the hybrid. I think that's why you're, you're hearing that now. But do you all have any questions about the resources or the training that we sent out to teachers or with Canvas? Any additional questions? Is there anything else I need to talk about, Lisa? 
No, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, just, you know, just want to, to say again that, you know, in Paula's defense, she had lots of questions and she would try to find the answers, but finding a person that could answer the questions was also difficult and it was new to all of us. I know Paula's worked very hard. I know she's taken a lot of, a lot of, uh, <laughs> a brunt of a lot of the frustrations, but she, she presented a lot of information. The other problem was probably that you have a teacher working all day to do your hybrid and your um, and her in person, and then we're like, here's a webinar you can watch for two yeah. hours on your own time. So, you know, that was also the frustration. But I can assure you that everything that Canvas had to put out and had to offer that we have sent, everything that we get our hands on, we make sure that the teachers have, have access to that. So, And in addition to what I've shared here, on Canvas itself, if they go into the Commons area and it was shared with teachers, there are training videos and webinars. There's a lot more than what I've shared here that's actually in their system that, you know, if you have a question about one certain aspect of Canvas, you can go and search that and there's a webinar or a video or something to help you implement that. So there's, you know, there's a lot more, a lot more than what I've um, shared right here that they have in their system. And this is what I have heard that Everybody in the state was going. Then the system crashed. You know, at times it was over. Oh over yeah, we we had times that nothing was working. Over that. Yeah. Plus, you know, we kept hearing that, mm -hmm. and they was you know their wits end. And a lot of the, uh, like when a teacher would set up their page and put links on, we have several different devices that students use. So you know, the link may have worked on this device, but how the parent set this device up didn't necessarily work because of the the settings that they had on their device. So we had to talk with, with parents about, you know, how do you set your device up where you can actually use and click on the links and they're going to work. I mean, that's very frustrating. We had several teachers that worked very hard and got their links done and they were so proud of them and then they, they publish it out to their students and you're getting all these messages, hey, the links aren't working. That's very frustrating and I understand that. Um, but, you know, we had to work through that technology part on our end with our devices to make sure that people knew how to set those up. So, Paula, what does Canvas do for a child that doesn't know how to read yet? How do they access this fantastic system that the teachers are now comfortable with? That's a good question. And I know that there are some read aloud components to some of the links that you can put on there. Um, I know some of the first grade teachers, um, I saw a lot of videos where they're, you know, it's just not links and just not resources and here's worksheets and here's, here's an assignment to do. There's a lot of videos that the, that the lower uh, grade level teachers are putting out there that I've seen. Maybe not all of them, but I've seen some of the videos. So, you know, they're trying to give a personal touch to it where, you know, the student is actually seeing a teacher. And the, the majority of the, not complaints, but concerns that I've heard from parents of the younger age children are that we may settle in to this virtual thing with the older kids and it may, it may end up working out really well. Mm -hmm. we're, I think we're still struggling a little bit with what that looks like for pre-K through three. Yeah, and I agree. I agree. I think that it's very hard to teach pre-K through three students virtually. They, you know, they need that one-on-one. -on -one. They need to learn how to read, and I think that's a struggle that we're seeing with the virtual learning. It, it may not be a good fit for every student at pre-K three, and I, and I get that. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Have any, huh? If you have any additional questions, just let me know. Yes. I know we've mentioned this before several times in meetings. What is? Are there other school systems that are that have specialty Canvas teachers that roam that are on call? I know we've got some that have just really gone above and beyond to take on yeah. that role in addition to what they're doing. But is anybody else? Providing some additional support by having a Canvas 
specials that yeah, I've heard, cares like money to pay to have in those buildings? I don't know how they're providing it, but in the meetings that I've been in with regional um, group or region districts, there are some school divisions that are, you know, putting out there, we have a virtual teacher for this grade level or for like K, maybe K2, they have a virtual teacher um, that's just covering those grade levels. And then the, the, the teachers that are in the classroom are just dealing with the face-to-face -face students. So yeah, I mean, I've heard, I don't know how they're paying for it if they are using the CARES money, but um, in conversations, they're, you know, people are doing different things in different school divisions. And that's one thing that they're trying to do is push just virtual teachers. I've seen that. Sure. I mean, I think that's something I'd like to talk about later, maybe. But the presentation takes a course, and then we can circle back. It's probably a bigger conversation with Dr. Humphrey Gass. Yeah. I do think the teachers are getting a lot more comfortable with it. I've they are. I've several of them, and they have expressed that. And like always, our Giles County teachers knock it out of the park. They do a very good job with what they're, they're supposed to do. We always have. Yeah. The most is the complaints I'm getting is doing both. Yeah. You know, they, the time management being able to do, so. Okay, thank okay. you. All right, thank you. Sorry, you should now have a copy of what we're presenting at least, and you can take some notes and that sort of stuff on them. I'm sorry that you didn't have it before. Um, before I turn it over to Jesse, I wanted to just show you a couple of web, uh, web link links. Um, to have information from the Department of Health, DOE, or the CDC. And then to, when, when we get towards the end of it, the discussion today, you'll see why uh, I've, in, I've incorporated um, this first one here, Department of Health. This, this is a, a new dashboard that was released uh, last, uh, last Monday, I believe it was, the 28th. This talks about this, this first link, just basically tells you about the data that's on this page. This second link here talks about the region metrics. It talks about far southwest, talks about near southwest, etc. And I can go to each one of these if you want me to. Um, weekly transmission talks about, uh, let me go ahead and go to. That again, that talks about the, uh, the region metrics. We can go by a region, and that should be as of today. Central, Eastern, Far Southwest, Near Southwest, Northern, Northwest, and the whole state. And you can look at the burden based on the burden and the trend based on cases, uh, daily uh, case incidence rate per 100,000. You can look at the uh, percent positivity and you can look at outbreaks and you can continue to go through. Weekly transmission, very similar information by region. Shares information based on region, and then it graphs it below. Is there a way to see per school system, Dr. RBS? CDC school metrics. That doesn't talk about school division. This talks about this is per locality. So you can go each locality right there. There's Dallas County. And this is updated as of today, October 8th. And you can see, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a, another CDC chart that shows you what talks about lowest risk, lower risk, et cetera. But you can see based on this model, Giles County as of today, the total number of new cases per 100,000 within the last 14 days, 41.56. We fall in the moderate risk area. This uh, second core indicator, the percentage of uh, tests, we fall in the lowest risk right now. Keep in mind, both of these are based on the last 14 days. So it's gonna continue to move. So you have a, a rough uh, day where there's an outbreak, two days, four days, it's gonna affect these numbers as you go along. And I, I've had information towards the end, again, to talk a little bit more about this, and you'll see, you'll understand a little bit better why I brought this up. Dr. RBS, do you get the 
I'm on the community services board, so I get the new Republicans task force update emailed to me every day by the board clerk there. Do you get those? Because I think it would be that information. I find it. I get it emailed every day from them. I think it would be helpful. I, I shared it with the board one day last week. Would you, if if you do get those, I don't get that every day. No. Can you, can you sign up to get that? Uh, I can. If because it's I, I think it would be good for the board to have that information. Just you know, because I think it's uh, it's coming from Doctor Bissell's office. So this is this is the, the, the information from the Department of Health. So before you leave that page, Dr. Rodriguez, when it said the percentage of tests that are coming back, what does that say? Percentage of tests that are positive during the last 14 days. Does it tell you how many tests were administered to generate that percentage? I don't no, I don't believe so. I think uh, it's determined. Percentage of tests in the community uh, that are positive during the last 14 days is calculated by dividing the number of positive cases over the last 14 days by the total number of cases resulted over the last 14 days. So this is this is the this is Department of Health BDA stuff here. So that would be the case, Jason. Well, that's a seven-day average. I mean, it, I, I just like it because it's more information. Right. I mean, I think everybody's listening needs to understand that this the way that information is provided to us, to Dr. Arbogast and people in this room that have to make the decisions, that reporting and the way it's done, you, we really need to understand. Because every time they change how they report it, you have to really dig in to make sure you understand how that statistic was generated. So when the flu season comes on, I don't know how they plan on keeping those separate. Dr. Bissell said that there was two different tests. I don't know what that's gonna look like if they start commingling, but I guess in the long, long and short, we don't need anybody panicking when they start seeing numbers and, and we, I guess we'll just do the best we can to Keep what's right. Yeah, it's, it's the RT, it's the RT PCR test, and I and I can't quote to you, Jesse. Can you tell me what? I, I don't I don't remember what the R, what that stands for. Uh, okay. Um, another the other link another link here it, it, again some the Virginia Department of Health guidance for mitigation measures in K twelve settings uh, that talks about um, again those core indicators that I just showed you. The secondary indicators uh, that were down further in that document, we didn't go really go talk about. Um, and then, it, and then it talked because the other core indicators talk about the, the basically five uh, mitigation key mitigation strategies: consistent and correct use of masks, the social distancing to the largest extent possible hand hygiene, cleaning and disinfection, and contact tracing in collaboration with your local health department. So that's the third core indicator of that chart. And then they, they use that information and talk, get, just give information for school divisions to consider. If you're at the lowest and lower risk, you, you wanna use the phase three guidance that's recommended. If you're at the moderate or higher risk, they, they recommend uh, phase two guidance. And then if you're at the, the red, the highest risk, then they recommend the phase one. This is from DOE. This just came out last week. It basically says the same thing that was in that Virginia Department of Health document. It talks about the lowest or lower, moderate or high, and then the highest says the same thing, except it's in a, in a, in a one-page chart. And then this is CDC information. And again, there's a lot of information on here, but th this, this is what I was, this is the CDC indicators and thresholds for risk of introduction and transmission of COVID in schools. So this is a chart, again, that talks about the three core indicators, number of new cases per 100,000 within the last 14 days, 
percentage of RT-PCR tests that are positive during the last 14 days, and the ability of schools to implement five key mitigation uh, strategies. And then you've got the secondary indicators down here as well. So when they click Giles, they're going to see cases in schools specifically or just in Giles County? You click, you click on Giles, this is Giles County. This is not by school. This is Giles County. This is the locality because this number here is determined by the number of cases within within the last four. It's the number of new cases in the county or community divided by the population in the county multiplied by 100,000 within the last 14 days. So when you go back to the, up there, why does it say Giles K through 12? School metrics. So they're using the. They're, they're, saying, they're saying. They're saying these these are see, these are this is information. The CDC framework. It's intended to it provide us information and assist us in making decisions. It's not telling us this is what you have to do. This does not dictate decisions. It's providing data to help us if we want to make decisions using. It. And you'll see. I don't have it right here. I can go into it, but then that jumps to the end of the conversation. I mean, that's just dangerous the way it's laid out. It says K through 12 school metrics, and then somebody's going to scroll right down and see 46 cases, and that's not what is happening in our school. Hmm. No, really? I mean, that has nothing to do with what I, 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 I can't control what, nope. what the CDC I'm has on, on their website. Uh, can. <clears throat> Or, or the or Department of Health, how they how they list it. But this, this is for the Giles, this is Giles County, and it talks about uh, the risk. It, it, it's what it is. It's, it's trying to help the communities better understand the risk of transmission into the schools. So I would look on the secondary indicators. I just. Talks about the percentage change of hospital patient inpatient beds uh, that are occupied, uh, inpatient beds that are in the region are occupied by patients with COVID. And again, this will make a little bit better sense when we get to the end of, of, of why I share it. Uh, I, I wanted you to at least see it. I'm sure you have seen it, but I wanted to make sure that if you hadn't, that you did, that you, you at least were aware that it was out there and, and we could and it was there. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Jesse because Jesse uh, has information that she's uh, gathered from the health department and from, uh, and, and from other sources that she'd like to share with you as well. Hello. You guys are having a good afternoon. Uh, I just wanted to go over some of the the things that I had been contacted about and questions asked by nurses, questions asked by parents. Um, definition of close contact for the CDC is someone who is closer than six feet within 15 minutes. The same definition practically for the VDH, close contacts is being within six feet of a person for at least 15 minutes and having exposure to the person's respiratory secretions now changed October 15th because it's not coughing, sneezing. They were released on October 5th that some, in and some infections can be spread by exposure to the virus in small droplets and particles, which means it's more of an aerosol. So the way I envision this is if someone is vaping, we're just going to use the vape as your breath so you see that vape go up and it goes out so anybody within that area will be breathing in that breath those droplets you know the virus itself is spread that way so they just released this this week after i had already done my presentation i had to add another slide <laughs> because that's that's just the nature of this virus they're finding stuff out every day that is different than what they put out the day before and that's what's posed a challenge 
just being a nurse in this time. People look to you for answers. You you want to have the correct answer for them, but the next day they'll come back and say, well, that's not what you told me last week. But it changes. And that's where our flexibility has had to come in for this. So um, it says that there's evidence, and these are quotes from the CDC, there's evidence that under certain uh, conditions, people with COVID-19 have infected others who are more than six feet away. Um, again, if you think of it like vaping, if they are, say you've got three positive kids in one room, they're all breathing. These masks are good if they are really snug and tight. If they're not, which most kids I've been in the schools, they don't fit the way they're supposed to. They're not, they're wearing them correctly, but they're too loose. So while they're breathing, it's going out, it's going up, it's going down. So if you've got three kids who are positive in a room of 20 kids while they're breathing, just think of it as vape. It's going up, it's going up. So it's affecting kids that are within that six feet range, but it may also be affecting kids that are not, just due to the volume, if that makes sense. So if you've got one person vaping in a room, they're, you know, the people that are Across the other side of the room they're not going to be as affected but if there's more than one or you know group of people that room's going to fill with those vapors pretty quickly does that make sense so this is all new new so we're, we're just learning about all of this stuff um, how we're doing now and how we've been doing this first part of school I think we've done very very well as far as the health monitoring for the teachers and staff and the nurses. Um, the nurses' offices are not overwhelmed with symptomatic children. We're sending home, we've been very strict about, you know, any kind of symptoms, especially grouped together. So if kids have a history of a migraine, as long as we know that, parent, we've talked to parents, they usually are good to stay. So, you know, the triaging of the patients are going well, and we're keeping a lot of kids in the school that need to be in the school, but. We're definitely sending numbers home just in an abundance of caution. You don't want to keep a kid there that has any any symptoms. Um, I think they're managing lunches and the buses very well while following those guidelines. Um, what about masks? That wasn't mentioned in either of those definitions. I reached out to Dr. Bissell and I said, I just need some clarification because the definitions that I see on both of those websites which are the ones that we're relying on we're following to come up with how we do things in the school they don't mention masks and we have a national association of school nurses that uh, we are members of i threw it out there just the question what are you guys doing how are you defining close contact within your schools and i may have had one or two that said masks were considered, I don't know the word I'm looking for, they were considered to be preventative as far as like the close contact definition. Most of them, and I mean these reach from Hawaii to New York to Texas, I got responses from all over. And none of them, they said it was regardless of a mask or no mask. Dr. Bissell said in the New River Valley that the guidance does not mention mask, but we are not seeing the secondary transmission if both parties are masked. And the way she described it was, if both parties are wearing masks, and it goes down to a scientific level, the molecules of the virus are smaller and they're not as severe. And that is how she explained it to me. Like, I guess what is able to get out isn't as, I don't know the word vicious, isn't as aggressive as if they weren't wearing any mask at all. The molecules would be larger and more aggressive. Um, so that brings us to if students are masked 100% of the time in school and they're sitting, she said the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended three to six feet, um, but that still puts you in that close contact. So we're taking out the 15 minutes of time. We're taking out the physical distance. The one thing we do have is the mask, but within that six feet, everyone is a close contact. So if you've got, I know a scenario I put in here was uh, Two kids had a sleepover over the weekend. They were fine. They've been in school. Now it's Wednesday. They both have temperatures of 101 and they're in the class together, sitting on opposite sides of the room. 
So if you think about it, three to six feet. Each kid has two kids in front of them and two kids on each side. So there's four, six, eight. Your classroom is 16 people. That class is going to get shut down. So that's kind of where I'm challenged with the thinking like it's going to happen if we bring the kids back. Classes will get shut down. Um, but that's just one of the one of the challenges that you have to make a decision on. So I just want you to be aware that the health department will consider kids in that classroom close contacts if they were within three to six feet of a positive student. Does that Dr. Bissell's understanding of, of the close contact definition or is that across the board, pediatrics, CDC, all major groups have adopted that same? About the masks? Yes. This was just what she said she had seen in the New River Valley. This is not coming from anywhere else. So that is just a, her interpretation? That's what she's seen across the New River Valley, yeah. I mean, it's pretty important what she thinks because she would be the one that would tell us what we had to shut down. Exactly. Yep. But right now, one of her first questions is where they wearing a mask. You know, but we've got the six feet distance. So if you're six feet with a mask, you're the chances are you're pretty good. You're not considered that close contact. But you take away the distance, and of course the time's gonna be taken away unless they're just passing in the hallway. Your close contact. So, I mean, what do they expect us to do? I mean, we've, we've already looked at the spaces we have. As long as that's in place, it, I mean, that's we have to just either you either have to what we're doing right now, or as a community, agree that we're okay with the risk of a 16 person classroom. When one or two cases happen, that whole classroom is shut down. Quarantine for 14. That's our two choices. Yes. You got anything good? <laughs> I don't know. I'll go over the concerns now. These are not just my concerns. These are just concerns in general. Um, going from a very minimal contact tracing at schools to much more due to lack of physical distancing, which is what I just said. So right now, we get a call, someone says positive in this class. So they contact, they need to contact, were you wearing a mask? Yes, done. It's not gonna be that simple this, you know, if, if they're closer together. It's gonna be making 20 phone calls instead of, you know, instead of the one. Our exposure risk to students impacts grandparents who are reliant on schools. I know I hate to say for childcare, but Grandparents are the ones that are able to help as as well, I should say, with the virtual learning. They may have challenges with technology. So right now, when they're sending their kids virtually or sending their kids to school face-to-face -face two days a week, they're at least getting that two days face-to-face -face a week. But So they choose to send them full-time because they can't do the technology side of it. But when they go back to school, the distancing is going to be gone. So I just feel like that would bring more of a, a risk to who they're coming home to. Um, our exposure to risk to students with chronic illnesses or compromised immune systems. So say right now, I'll use an example, my son has asthma. And right now, it's good. He's got the six feet distance. He's not considered a close contact. However, if we go back, the kid has asthma or respiratory issues or diabetes or they're undergoing some kind of cancer treatment, those parents may be less likely to send that child to school because that distance is gone. That makes sense. So these kids with the chronic diseases, and there's a lot of kids with asthma. I didn't realize when I started in school, I mean stacks of kids with, with asthma in action. So those parents will be having to make a critical decision. Do I send my kid back knowing that they're going to be closer together and more kids in a room or do I keep them home when my kid's getting D's and F's and he is an A, B student just doing the hybrid. So do I feel like my son would do better four days a week? Yes, I do because he's an A, B student and right now it's CDF student. But with him being in, enclosed in a room with that many kids, two to three feet apart, his risks will be higher. 
So that I think parents will be challenged in that way, making those decisions for the kids that have those chronic illnesses. Um, flu season is quickly approaching. Uh, I asked Dr. Bissell about this as well. She said, it's unknown. It's an unknown, unknown territory. We don't know what's gonna happen. Um, ideally, transmission rates will be lower because the flu is harder to contract than COVID-19. So the measures we're taking, ideally would keep the flu numbers lower. But again, you go back to the kids that are at home or going here or going there on the weekends. I mean, we can only control what they do during the week at school. So, and they're masks, they, they go crazy on the weekends, come back and a mask that's halfway falling off and they're in a classroom. It's just, it's uncharted territory and we don't know what's going to happen if they get the flu strep in combination with COVID-19. Um, students will have to wear masks all day long. They will no longer get a break while sitting at their desks. I did all my screenings the past three weeks, four weeks. The kids rely on those breaks. I mean, most of the classrooms I went in, you know, they're spaced out. They had their masks off. They put them back on when I came in the room, but they like to, they like that, that break. Sitting at the class, sitting in class with their mask off feels a little more normal. So, um, I already went over my scenario. So that brings you to the behavioral health and mental health preparation. Kids are going to be coming back, having to wear the mask all day, not getting a break. Um, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, schools school should anticipate an increase in wide range of emotional and mental health needs for both students and staff when returning to full time. Will this be different? You know, they're getting used to what we're doing now. If they come back full time, again, the mask will be on. PE may be limited or taken due to having to use cafeteria or gyms for cafeterias. Um, of course, their families may be going through things. A lot of these kids that have been all virtual since March, no one's laid eyes on these kids. We don't know what's going on at home. I know the first week I covered a school that the nurse was out, I called DSS and they were just waiting. They knew because we haven't seen these kids. So that's a concern as well. Um, what's been happening? Nobody knows what's been happening with these kids. You know, they're gonna come back and they've relied on their teachers and their staff, their nurses, their counselors as confidants. They go in their office, they shut the door and talk. A lot of these kids haven't had that since March. So um, making sure that the counselors and um, in our VCS, the in in service people are available, and I don't know if we need to bring in more come back full time. Just to, I mean, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of issues happening. So our goals, of course, is to bring as many students back to school as safely as possible and follow the guidelines at the same time. Which, like you said, I don't know that we can do both. Um, like I said, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends three to six feet. Um, so that's the guidelines they set forth, but that's not the guidelines the Virginia Department of Health or CDC has posted. Um, keeping their students and families that go home to so safe and healthy, keeping staff, family safe and healthy. I know there's a lot of teachers, staff members that take care of elderly parents. They've been able to follow the guidelines to this point. Um, so if you're kind of you're taking some things away, it does it puts more than just the students and the staff at risk. Um, and retain all faculty and staff. I know, speaking to a couple of teachers that have chronic illnesses, multiple sclerosis, uh, some COPD, some different things like that, who their doctor said you cannot continue to work if the guidelines or the guidelines are not being followed, just due to their chronic illnesses as well. Um, and then the last slide is how to keep schools safe when reopening. And these are just the, the things that we've already talked about. One thing that I have noticed in schools is that um, some of the teachers are, um, this is elementary, middle, some of the teachers are not moving classrooms. It's the students who are moving. And I didn't know, I mean, that's one thing that I think is pretty important is to keep them in their, their same cohort and not to move different desks. but. Um, I don't know if they're disinfecting desks in between, but it's one thing that I think needs to happen as well. Are you hearing me saying the 
medical community with your chat rooms and whatnot, what what is going to have to happen for us to get a change in guidance for that distancing requirement? Because we, until that happens, we're going to have to assume risk and quote unquote not follow guidelines. And I know there's a big part of this community that feels like those guidelines probably can be pushed back against some, but there's a big group that absolutely follow them as the law. So is there anything like, would the vaccine be the magic bullet that finally lets people feel comfortable? I talked to the health department about that and they, they're they not sure when the vaccine's gonna be out for one thing and it will be new. So I, I would foresee that a lot of parents would not vaccinate their children right away, right when this vaccine came out, since it was so new. That's just the chatter I'm hearing. But so as a board, what you're telling us is that we, we're going to have to make a tough decision to not follow guidelines at some point if we want to go back in the foreseeable future. That being probably the rest of the school year in, to in total. Per CDC and health department, those are the guidelines. I, I know I don't want to be in your shoes. <laughs> I don't want to make those decisions. But the American Academy of Pediatrics, that's where, where you're, you've got right. to fly out there. That's right. three, three to six feet, mask for everybody. Right. You, okay. That's their recommendation. Mm -hmm. But then Dr. Bissell says inside of six feet with a mask, we're still going to call that a contact. She'll do the interviews and, and determine time, length of time and proximity what, if they are a close contact or not. But, yeah. Sorry, I didn't have like happy, cheery part of the presentation. <laughs> I, guess, I guess my question would be, because we haven't talked to Dr. Bissell. Sure. We've got guidelines that will result in close contact and also the classroom shutdown for less than six feet. I think we all accept that and we understand. What I want to know is a safety standpoint. What does Dr. Bissell say about 26 and 30 feet, everybody wearing masks? Is that? Yes. Is that safe in her? In her email, I'd have to pull up, I didn't print her email off in her response, but if I'm recalling correctly, she felt as long as there was a, at least a three foot distance between the students and they stay masked all day long, she felt that was acceptable. Okay. So if we had to go to a plan that required masks all day and the logistics not even in the discussion, and that went in front of her, she would not strike it down as not being approved. Not that I not that I foresee. I foresee that she would think that was acceptable. I think you're gonna hear from her that on the buses and in the buildings, masking is very important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> I do think, I mean, as far as like a standpoint of how they're doing now, I think everybody's doing great. Being in the schools, watching the kids, they're so good. They keep their masks on, they stay spaced. The little ones are the cutest because they really are good because they have squares on the floor and they they do. Now the high schoolers, I'm like, at least try to space. I told them I was doing their screenings. I'm like, at least try to space out. Look like you're trying a little harder, but well, that's high no schoolers for you. Reason who's going to get it. Right. There's no way. No. And there's no rhyme or reason. In, how anybody's gonna react to it some I mean, people don't even know you, i mean yes you, you have a you have a basketball team you get a, a a girl who has it been around with the girl the same day mm -hmm. drinking after her bathing after would you not think she would get it you would think yeah that's right but then you other, don't know other ones did who wasn't anywhere around yeah so there you know there's no rhyme or, i mean you know, mm -hmm. and she was like oh i'm definitely gonna get it she definitely didn't get it. And that may go through the aerosol. That may be where they're finding it's more like in the air you're breathing rather than. Well, they work out together. They breathe on you. There's no answer. Yeah, there's no, like I said, there's no rhyme or reason. Who's and that's, gonna get it? that's the scary part with that and how they're going to react to it. Somebody doesn't have symptoms, another person healthy, 20 year old may pass away. There's no, of course, you're at higher risk if you've got chronic diseases but there are just there are just random ones that you, there's no explanation as to why they reacted that way you get any guidance uh, you mentioned that the nurses group i mean what are what are other school systems doing that you know of as far as uh, 
between six and three feet. I mean, that that's that seems like the magic area that we're kind of stuck with, and I think all of us board members have got to decide. I mean, we I think it's clear. Yes, we're that's close contact. But what are the school systems doing? Are they not many have ventured back? I mean, I think we're one of just surrounding. We're one of the first that are trying to get back. Thought, other than Pila, I think Pila. I thought land. I thought land was back. And with is going back. I, I think Wits Wits starting to go back October twelfth. I think with more group. I think uh, Pulaski started uh, Monday. Galax started Monday uh, with more students coming back. Um, do, Montgomery do. Montgomery County still is doing uh, the half day group in the morning, half day in the afternoon, uh, and then having all virtual. Do we have any idea what what their guidelines are? I mean, I, I'd like to know because they they've. I guess have gone ahead of us or going ahead of us to expand on hybrid and I'd like to know what what they've kind of looked at and what their numbers are I mean because they've got to have some of them have the same space concerns that we do yeah. I've, I've, I've talked to Pulaski and, and, and it's my understanding and I could be wrong they're they're adhering to as close to six foot as possible but because because what we what you hear are hearing what you're hearing is that 100 percent of them are in attendance that's they're not 100 percent in attendance because they have 30 percent just like we do that are full-time virtual so it's really boils down to 70 percent uh in attendance well I, I i heard what you said but what i'm concerned about is they're saying as close to six feet as possible that means there's a lot there's wiggle room there so i like to kind of if we could find out just what we're looking at what are the people are you know, if we're, if we're outside the realm of possibilities, that we've got to go down to three feet. Uh, and Kaisi says, okay, we're looking at five feet, four and a half feet, whatever it is. I mean, I think it, that comes into factor in what we've got to look at. And I'd like to kind of see what, what other systems are doing. I mean, that's why we're in, we're all in the same boat and they're fighting the same things. And, and you know, we don't have to all reinvent the wheel. I think uh, I'm more worried about not actually the feet. I'm worried about. Yeah, I haven't numbers. talked to them. I haven't talked to him. Coming back and getting the virus. I'm worried about those numbers. I'm worried about those numbers too, but I think we've got, as a board, we've got a, you know, we've got a, a, a guideline that says, you know, they're going to be close contact. We've got a health department saying three to six feet with mask should be okay. We've got the American Academy of Pediatrics saying three to six feet with mask will be okay. Pulaski saying less than six feet, get as close to six feet as possible, but they're obviously in the language that they're using is less than six feet. We've got to, regardless of what anybody's numbers, we've got to take the precautions to feel safe for our kids and our students uh, and, and have those in place because, you know, if the numbers do rise, we don't want to be hit with them. I mean, all this is great information, but at the end of the day, unless we're planning on building additional school buildings and expanding classrooms by magically pushing their walls out, we have got to find a plan that gets us back into the building for CDC, pediatrics, and everybody else is going to stay super safe before they're comfortable enough to come off of that. Because the first time they come off that distancing and one person dies, then they're done. So they're going to wait until it's absolutely 100% super safe. And by then, we have lost maybe two generations of classes that can't read. I could foresee this going into that the next That have year. been mentally damaged from Keep this. That have, I mean, I know nobody wants to hear it. Everybody's terrified. But we are in the business of teaching. Right. And we're we, we just being being comfortable and staying in AB forever because that beats the six foot distancing. We can't. I don't think that's that's doing our kids justice. We're not. And I'm not saying that the staff in this room hasn't already supported an enormous amount of time in this. That is not why we're in this room today. And if any of our comments come across that way, that is not how they're meant. All of us are just in a terrible position, and we we've got to figure out a way to help these kids and, and not injure our, our employees. But from from your presentation, Jesse, we, we they, they're giving us what we asked for this from the very beginning. We said don't mandate, 
Don't tell us what we can and can't do. Don't put that line in the sand. Give us some flexibility. That's what they're doing. Yeah. They're not going to say, we 100% say what you have said, well, nobody's going to get hurt. And I don't want to say that either. Well, no, they, <laughs> right, that's why. Right, I'm just us, giving you the facts. They've given us that right. Yeah. So it's we a, we've got to decide where it's we're risk. comfortable operating in that in that flexible zone. Uh, the easiest thing to do is bring them all back. The hardest thing to do, uh, and the safest thing to do, is keep it all virtual. So we've got that. You can't do that, things. right? <laughs> Jesse, thank you. You're so welcome. Very much. You guys thank have you, any Jesse. questions at any point? Email me because I ain't here much. <laughs> Email is the best way to reach me. You're Thanks, Jesse. If you're all, no. If you're okay, John's here. I don't know if you want to diverge. Yeah, Bill Bruce Beach I'm I'm working with John. I mean, that's up. That's up to you all. I didn't. I want to make that. I want to. John, we can be here till. Do you all you want to let John? Is that okay with staff in here? I don't want you guys to think we're like interrupting anybody. So we'll go from good news. You've got good news? We'd like some of the cards to come up. Or sure, sure. 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 <clears throat> Dr. Arbogast asked me to come in and talk about bowlers. I understood there were questions. Is that correct? Or We just know now that the folks have come through, they've torn them down, they've tried to put together maybe a list right. ranking. <clears throat> and I guess this board, we at one point, we were getting ready to pull the trigger on 100 plus thousand bucks because we were terrified that the Nairn's Elementary boilers were going to put the kids out of the building at any moment. Now maybe that's not the case, and we're just trying to understand what right. So what has changed? Well, <clears throat> what changed is we had a uh, ACI from Rono come in, tear down the bars, look at the components internally. Obviously, you've got to have some uh, specialization in that field to get into, and uh, so cleaned down or torn down rather, cleaned them, went through them. I did a combustion analysis on each of the bars, and uh, that was Nairs Elementary. Uh, they are, their, their comments on that one were that they were old but in good working order. So uh, apparently, they, uh, according their opinion is they're not in imminent danger of a catastrophic failure of a, fire, of a water tube or some fire tube rather, uh, or something along those lines that would cripple the boiler. It's not something we couldn't get components to hopefully bring back to life. Um, with that said, they comments they are old. Doesn't mean we're completely out of the woods. It means we maybe have you know, another winter before we have to worry about that. Um, Macy jumped to that one next. Um, initially, they said, that's the last time we spoke about boilers, was that Macy needed a boiler. And uh, I had some time to go back out and look at that a little deeper by myself. I spent a couple of hours in there just looking around. The boiler wasn't leaking at the time the valves were on, so it had system pressure on it and was not leaking water. I called the company back, they met me next morning or two we started up and, run, and ran the boiler up to temperature what was happening was condensation and I, I the service guy had not seen that volume of condensation come out of a boiler but i've seen them do the exact same thing for the 20 years i've been here including when they were obviously moving their equipment so after that uh he, he did identify a few action items at macy that, that uh insulation on the Fire doors, etc., need to be replaced. Uh, I think our total for the entire system was in the five thousand dollar range that uh, of repairs we need now um, for op for safe operation, which is very minimal, I think, considering we haven't done a a tear down like this, and I can't remember when. So, so who told us at one point we were going to need to do hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of? And I, I'm just trying to understand. Sure. We almost did that, and. Which side are we talking about, Mr. Dude? The Nairs Elementary. Well, I don't. I think you still need to plan for that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's uh, the structural integrity of the boilers is good, as you can tell from the tear down that was done. With that said, that doesn't change the fact they're 24 years into operation, right. and uh, you definitely need to 
to plan for that. In my opinion, in the next year or two, we need to be making some just tough decisions there to uh, to get that done. My hope is that you would consider looking at a more comprehensive approach as opposed to just boilers. Now that we hopefully have some more time. And with that said, there's nothing that says they don't go down. Any of them, brand new ones for that matter. But I think we really need to take a look at a comprehensive upgrade there. Um, may be next in my opinion. I think we need to spend some time on looking five, ten years down the road, maybe two to five years down the road, about what we need to do to uh, keep operation, keep operational, keep maintenance from becoming a bigger nightmare than it is, and, and make sure we've got comfortable schools. Come up with maintenance plans. Uh, capital yeah, improvement plan. Yeah. More I, than just the boilers. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. There's a mention, for example, the boilers are, are one facet of that. You know, you've got a cooling tower. Our central, uh, central plant, in my opinion, should be upgraded, including outside air units, to, you know, I, I would hope get us another 20 years out of that building. At that site specifically, you don't, in my opinion, need to change all of the individual heat pumps. But if you lose one of those heat pumps, you know, that's something our maintenance guys can change out in, in a week. You've got a classroom, maybe you've got to do something different, maybe you don't. You're down for a week as opposed to a central plant, a disaster, so. Right. So, so back to your question, Mr. Steele, I still think you need to replace the boilers in the mm -hmm. near future. Well, I mean, unfortunately, I think we were trying to do this in conjunction with the overall full facility evaluation that has been halted because of COVID and the inability to move all that ahead at the same time. So, I mean, at some point, the board, we're going to have to decide do we request John and our facility folks to start working on some kind of a, a plan Moving forward, I, mean, I think we you, you have to have, yeah, we have to have a conversation how we want to proceed with the the rest of the facilities assessment because have because right shared, now have we shared with the county the the facilities index score? Uh, no, I shared that with y'all and I shared it with John. Yeah, I, okay. John has it, and I glanced at that. I won't tell you that I memorized it, but <laughs> when I looked at it, it didn't surprise me that they said basically Nares Elementary and Macy are the the next two we really need to consider we mechanical we upgrades. We knew that. Bruce, we need yeah. HVAC. Yeah. Exactly. So it boils, but yeah, the HVAC and roofs, that's what it boils down to. I mean, but I mean that, that's a conversation we need to figure out whether we're going to keep going with it or say, yeah, a broader hey, part. doing what you did, we need to pay for what you did, and then decide how you how you want to move forward. Well, I, just, just personally, you know, we can, the other part of that study, that's a battle for another day. I just think. As in a likelihood, regardless of what comes out of that, and not to start that, we're going to have five those five buildings or six buildings in use, and we have got to. I don't think. When's the last time we've done any capital improvements on anything other than the vocational school last? The Tech Center in Eastern. Two thousand nine. Yeah, two thousand I mean, whatever. We're that was eleven years nine. down the road. We have got to have heat, and we got to have dry buildings, and we have got to that's not going to be cheap and so we've got to get it with his his bosses because it's going to cost money that's probably debt service and that doesn't you know the other things that are in that again that's a fight for another day sure maybe maybe not <laughs> well and i was thinking coming here uh giles high school and, and there's high school for example i'll use giles i'm a little better on the timeline but if i uh, construction began in 1959. First class was 1962, I think, give or take, give or take a year. Summer in that neighborhood. Flash forward to 1998, 97, 98. You start planning to renovate, and 99, your your demo and commission 2000. You're in that, you're in that window, 25, 30 year window, with two schools renovations right now. Um, not to say there aren't needs at other schools, but those two definitely. Yeah, yeah. Tech Center and Eastern. 09, two high schools for 99, 2000 area. Costs will be higher, obviously, because of inflation and, and things just cost more, relatively speaking, even. But uh, if you look at those renovations we've already done, we've, we've gone from coal fired boilers, steam heat, to now we've got gas fired boilers, 
four pipe uh, HVAC with chillers and efficient gas boilers, you reinvented the wheel last time. It's going to cost a lot of money, no, no question about that. But it's not, in my opinion, if you don't substantially change how you operate the buildings, and that's the question that I'm not, I have no expertise in that, and I'm not going to hazard an opinion. But you don't have to do nearly the scope of renovation that you did back then to bring things back up. The, the pipe, for example, the trunks, I can't imagine that the welded pipe is in, needs replaced. That's already in there. We basically went to the Cadillac system in all these schools when we did, at the time. Well, 97, 96, 97. Yeah, exactly. You, you, you went from, again, coal fired and steam to uh, four pipe gas and chillers. So the, the hard part's done in a lot of ways. It's just a matter of, uh, and, and again, there's elementary. You've got roughly 40 heat pumps in there. I don't think you need to change all 40 heat pumps. I mean, they're still operational. Change those 10 at a time, and as they go out, you're not losing the whole building. You're, you're losing the classroom, potentially, and they've been running pretty well because of good water chemistry. So. I mean, the first step is to understand what each building needs and how quickly it's needed. Absolutely. In my, in my opinion. This board can't do anything until we have that ranking and understanding of timeline. And then if we want to try to figure out whether we want to make sure certain buildings have a little more flexibility depending on how they may change from a use standpoint, I think that is another day and another discussion. But I think Jason is right, no matter what, we need to know what the envelope looks like and what is needed when for all of our buildings to absolutely. Fix up on. absolutely is that a, do you need assistance from well, that firm or well i mean mechanical technical side john to, to, so, to get so definitely when you get to design yes i mean you've that's way right. of my head um the, the ranking is helpful and again did commit that to the firm. was glancing through it and, and going back through it again well, as you guys talked about the other issue but mm -hmm. Macy and there's elementary on, on the HVAC system. You know, you're you're a two out of a five, one to five scale. Two being you've got you're at the end of its useful life. You've got two to six years till you have to replace it. So, I mean that that didn't surprise me. That's honestly pretty consistent with what my own opinions were. Um, so, it, what I would what we need to get moving is to rank the sites as you said. Decide which ones we're going to focus on. So if you say there's elementary. I'm going to try to do something in the next two years, um, a substantial mechanical upfit, and get moving on that. All right, year three and four, is it Macy? We can start planning for that. We'll need technical assistance as far as experts to come in and look. Look what we've got, is there a better way to do it? Um, with Nares Elementary, I think I presented December, some, sometime this winter. The exact dates escape me, but uh, the 800 and some odd thousand dollar estimate that was um basically to do a complete update on the central plant um, that would be something that if you decided you're going to do that that's that's the first step towards that process next step is to get in and start sharpening the pencil and and really considering what we're going to do this is about the lowest we're going to have interest rates yeah in our lifetimes absolutely well in my mind no matter what the future fight looks like on other buildings, the elementary schools, we've always known that we're going to need those no matter what moving forward. They're busting the seams all the time, so I think we're probably not going to have much of a battle on this board, even with the facilities evaluation when it comes to elementary school upgrade. So, what's the board feel like we need from? Mr. Ross and our facility management team. So that's that's y'all's new name, John Facility Management Team. The FMT. It got worse. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> I mean, a ranking on which one and how many years we had. Yeah, I mean, and if that that's else? a committee we need to get back yeah. into our committee meetings and and hash that out. That's that's great. Um, okay. That's that's probably the, in my opinion the next step is to get a consensus uh, and as Mr. Buckle mentioned 
obviously the Board of Supervisors who are represented on that committee need to be involved because they're the ones that uh, when financing and, and those kind of things come into play have to be on board. But uh, I, I think I think just need to make a decision and, and start doing something. All right, I don't want to paralyze this meeting, but I think we will very quickly figure out when we can get together and maybe have something that's focused more on what you can help us understand. Sure. In relation, relation to ranking, and it it might be good to cover, um, you know, just briefly cover the material, kind of view that as a committee. That right. that uh, I forget the name of the firm. CRA. Thanks, CRA. Mm -hmm. uh, gave to us, kind of go through that. Again, I didn't didn't have any great surprises with that. That's pretty consistent with what my own thoughts were. So, okay, and, and just start going that way. How quickly would you be ready to have a meeting like that? Do we need to give you some time. To... I think we can do it today. I mean, it's it's more of a conversation okay. than a presentation. If I'm not, we can get the people together. You'd be ready to sit down. Yeah, I mean, well, if I understand what you're asking, we're going to have a conversation. I'm you're not asking me to give a dissertation on the uh, on that report we got. I mean, it's, I think it's more of a conversation than at this point and a group decision than it is. Okay. I feel like we're not ready to get a call next week with the board's down. Well, you could, but I don't think so. How about that? Okay. And, and I, that's great news. It gives us time to do something that's, as I mentioned before, what I didn't like about changing boards now is what if we get into the redesign which is very possible because we were talking about taking the GM off the of central plant, those kind of things. Boiler sizes go down dramatically at that point. I don't want to put back something that's not going to fit in with what we might do a year from now. And that's why I think we need to be smart Absolutely. about what we do and not just slap something Absolutely. Back in there as exactly. A band aid, yeah. And what the, the facility evaluates is a whole other animal, but the fact that we have run the buildings the same way from the beginning of time that's not sustainable no matter what happens so people teach different we gotta be able to take some of those huge spaces offline and not use them and absolutely we got we got to be smart about that so well and, and there's you know just operation of the last 20 years everybody's been witness to that right. understands how it could maybe work better high schools the office for example when we do go back with our just as one example we should definitely have the administration offices on a different system than the central plant. There's no need running the chiller and the boiler to do a thousand, fifteen hundred square feet office space. This that's, doesn't, and that's crazy. It doesn't Even make sense. When they have uh, basketball events, the whole building fires up. Not necessarily. We've got the ability to we still we are able to the central plant comes zone on. Off, yes, zone absolutely. Do that. Yes. And and as you say zone off, that's another huge factor in all this are controllers. We've talked about that forever. That you know our control system is 20 years old. The if you talk to the control guys, the, I think the five the life expectancy is five years, but because of how fast technology evolves, uh, we've had really good success with a lot of them. But you know we're getting to the place where we really need to do something with those too. As as it was proven with Giles, that can that can be very detrimental to uh, to operations. So. I think that's good, I, I, and I think maybe we, as a committee, sit down and talk about that, and then then the boards would need to get together and decide what's the best path, best path forward as far as um, how you're going to pay for it. Does it make sense to everybody? And go from there. All right, John. Thank you very much. No problem. Any other questions from the thank board? You John Ross. What's up? Thank you, John. Oh, you're very welcome. So, uh, you guys will let us know when, when you want to sit down? I think we may want to have some discussion just here, make sure, sure we know exactly what that track looks right. like before we jump right into a committee meeting, but that's just me speaking as one board member. Well, I, th we, I think you guys need to have a conversation. That's all something right, that I'm... Okay. Sounds great. Thanks for coming down. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now the easy stuff. <laughs> um, before we look at the school nutrition slides, I just want to give you guys an update <clears throat> to remind you 
how we're currently feeding students. We feed them, of course, when they're in school, and we're also delivering twice a week. We do a five-day bag and a three-day bag. Five-day bags are for 100% virtual students, as well as any other student, child, in Giles County. And then we do a three-day bag every Thursday. That's for your hybrid students. So every child has a potential of eating breakfast and lunch every day, Monday through Friday, in Giles County for free. We started free on September 1st through USDA. That's nationwide. Right now that's set to expire December 31st, but I think it's gonna get probably extended through the end of June to help give families additional relief. So that's a good thing. Christy, let me uh -huh. just to tack on to that. Of all the challenges that we've had as a school system, the food program has been the shining light that has like carried us I think it's been that one thing that kind of kept everybody's head just above water. I mean, it is yeah. just from a emotional support yeah. to just make sure kids eat. Yeah, it what was. You guys have done has been absolutely. I mean, it's, it's kept us above water. Yeah, it wasn't right. just about feeding kids. It was about seeing kids and letting them know that we were still here. We cared about them. We checked on them. You know, it was it was really a blessing for this county. You know, we, we shut down on Friday, March 13th, and we started on Monday, March 16th, and hit every week until 10 days before school started. That was, it, it was a blessing. Yes. Yeah. You said, if y'all get tired, you, you don't think that you are not. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> a critical part of, of success. I mean, everybody, if I talk to somebody, they're like, yeah, this is tough, and I wish kids can get back, but I'm worried about COVID, but I tell you what, the food, that, that's awesome. That's Thank how every you. conversation goes. It was a community effort. It was multiple people, volunteers. I mean, everybody up here, all the volunteers, all school nutrition, bus drivers, everybody. Yeah. So, so it was, it was, it was great. So thank you for that. So, okay, um, but I will say, even though we are feeding kids every day or offering meals to kids every day, participation is low. Last year, for example, in a normal September, we fed an average of 800 breakfasts a day and 1,236 lunches every day. So this September, in our new normal, we feed 715 breakfasts a day and 851 lunches a day. So you can still see our numbers are low. I don't like that. I don't know why. Um, I, I, I don't know why, but... It's, I, I do know, you know, we handed out EBT cards, pandemic EBT, EBT cards twice this year. That was through the state, through the expansion of the SNAP benefits. That probably hurt our participation, but it helped families and that's what it's about. So, but participation is low. We're still, I mean, serving low numbers on in school kids. Meals are free. I don't know why they're not taking it, but they're not. So that's, that's the kids that are actually in the building aren't taking the lunch even though they're no. in person? No. No, participation is really low. But it's coming up. Yes, they are packing. They're eating. Okay. okay. Yes, but it, it is low, so we're not sure. Um, and just to remind you too, so when kids come in school and they come through the front door, they can get breakfast for free, grab and go, and they take it to their classroom and they eat it. And then at lunch is the only time it's different. All children, all grades come through the cafeteria lines, but pre-K through three eat in their classroom, in, in the cafeteria. All other grades are in the classroom, okay? So that's how we're currently doing it. And everybody gets food in boxes. There's no trays, there's nothing open. Everything is covered to avoid possible contamination. So we feel really good about how we're feeding children currently. So what we're going to show you are school nutrition slides and possibilities that could be implemented should the board decide we want to increase students to four days a week. So slide one is just our basic cafeteria table. That's pretty much what all schools have. It's a 12-seater, six-seater with a, with a folding mechanism in the middle. Okay. Now this is an example, even though it's eight on one side, but just for showing purposes. This is what we could do in the cafeterias if you wanted to increase the students eating inside the cafeterias. We can purchase these table dividers. 
and give us more space, you, potentially. It's an added barrier of protection. So before you leave that slide, Jesse, what, <laughs> what does that look like for if a student gets a positive result and that table had, so Christy, would they all, all of those orange seats be full? No, we're gonna talk about that. Yeah, which, which, okay. She's gonna talk okay. about that. Okay. okay. So this slide is our existing tables physically distance this way, but not right across, but you have dividers. So we are not six feet apart. You are left to right, but you're not sitting across or back to back. You're not six feet apart. You would be three feet apart. But keep in mind, they don't have masks on. They're eating. Um, but we could purchase with CARES funding part, those plastic partitions that would go completely down the table and go crisscross. So you could seat kids either across or diagonal, however concoction the principals want to set them, but you can only fit four kids per table. With the dividers. With the dividers. Being six feet apart. And be six that, feet apart. That's key because they don't have their masks on. Right. <clears throat> but there is a shield, so you know, if a kid is sick and they projectile vomiting, it would hit the shield, hopefully, because they are pretty tall. So, I mean, it should cover something like that, but just the general, no. So does that divider make the, the distance between them face-to-face, -face, not being six feet, that makes that not a contact? I guess that would be a question for the health department. That would be a Dr. Bissell question. I would think not. That it wouldn't be a contact? That it would be a contact. It still would be a contact. Yes. Yeah, they're 27 inches from the table to the top of the divider. I'm sure we could get them longer, but. So, so we would be buying the dividers to try to be as healthy, as, as safe as possible, knowing that if a case happened, that still wouldn't stop the. the right, it's an added layer of protection. Yeah, another, just another barrier. Yeah. Right, kind of like the shields. Mm -hmm. uh, there's different opinions between the shields aren't as nearly as protective as a mask. Or the, the gators, they say, are not protective at all either. I mean, you can blow a candle out through one of the gators. I mean, just from my professional opinion, I don't foresee that. Like, me to blow a candle out with this mask on my face is going to be pretty much impossible. But the gators are so thin that particles, air, it's able to get through it pretty easily. So. I would imagine they would be easy to knock Actually, they're not. Um, you can you can bolt them to the them tables off. or get like a clamp and, yeah, and put them on there. You can um, secure them, but yeah, and they just wipe down with an alcohol wipe. So they're you know they're actually and they do come apart. So if you had that sick child that projectiled on it, you could disassemble it relatively easy and clean it. Yeah. Okay. Slide four, these are the seating capacities for elementary middle schools. And keep in mind too, when, when I did these, I did not factor into the distancing between tables back to back. So most of your schools are not six feet apart back to back if students were seated at both seats. Like if here at Mary's Elementary, if you had a student here and a student here, that's not six feet apart. It's close to three feet apart, honestly, at that school. But I did assume, just for ease of factoring, that every table was six feet apart back to back. So, for example, Eastern Elementary has total enrollment of 407, but you only have 305 hybrid. So the physical distancing capacity for Eastern would be 76. Macy would be 92, and Nares Elementary would be 96. These are just your elementary schools here. Your high schools, Giles High School is, is pretty much six feet apart. Their tables back to back are six feet apart. So I feel really good about saying Giles High School has a seating capacity of 84 and still keeping kids six feet apart. Nairs does not. They are not six feet apart. But even if they were, I would say 52, keeping six feet apart. So we also looked at 
elementary, middle, lunch schedules, and maximum seating capacities. And based on that, and again, this is hypothetically, if all students came back to four days a week, could we seat them in the cafeteria for lunch if you determine you want them to eat in the, in the cafeterias? We would exceed maximum seating capacities for six grade levels at Eastern, six grade levels at Macy, and three grade levels at Nares Elementary. The high schools, Giles would need four and a half lunch periods, even though they're spaced six feet apart. They would need four and a half lunch periods to still <coughs> have the kids there socially distanced. And Nares High School would need 4.2 lunch periods to stay within the capacity. Yes, yes. So, it, you know, it's really clear that if you do decide to reintroduce students back to a four day week, we should not eat in the cafeterias, but that's a decision you all can make. Um, I did go ahead and ask surrounding school divisions. I asked five divisions how they were feeding students just for comparison purposes. And four of the five were already going to school four days a week. So four of the five that I talked to are already in school four days a week or and offering 100% virtual, but all five were eating breakfast in their classrooms. Zero were eating lunch in the cafeteria, except for primary students, and all of them were allowing primary students to eat in their cafeterias. Zero were using these table partitions. All three, uh, three were eating outside as much as possible and plan to continue that even during the colder weather. They want to eat outside. And I even asked one of them, I said, what do you do on rainy days? They go outside, they take umbrellas. They eat outside, they put up tarp or canopies. They eat outside. Yeah, I know. Wait, is this in a third world country or is this No, it's local. <laughs> it's local. Oh. Um, so, you know, I mean, that being said, school nutrition is easy because we adapt and move on with whatever you decide. So whatever y'all decide to do about bringing students back, we're part of the team and we'll, we'll definitely go forward with whatever you decide. So they could eat if they go back four days. Would we be able to make the schedule work where they could eat in a classroom? Not, not all grade levels, no. They wouldn't be spread. You wouldn't be able to spread them out, so you could, you'd have to they split them be up. In the same boat as the cafeteria. Right, if they, if, we, if they didn't eat in the cafeteria, is what I'm saying. Oh yes, the the hardest part if you bring them back four days a week is how are you going to physically distance them in the lines and coming to the cafeterias? You know, your lines right now are actually really small because you've only got you know 30 kids at any given time coming through the line. But if you add all these students back, you're gonna have possibly 100 at one time. And how are you gonna keep them six feet apart? The lines are gonna come out the doors and, you know, it can be done, but it's gonna be difficult. And that's the hardest part for principals um, to work on is how are we gonna get kids physically distance if it is six feet apart in line while they're waiting to go get their box meals. So not even in a cafeteria, they weave, it's like being at a music park line. They do, and, and that's what we're doing now. But you say even you're double. They would be with probably poured out in Yeah, the which is fine. I mean, it's it actually has gone very smoothly. Yeah, it, it's. Are we using auditoriums at the high schools for anything that would prevent them being used for lunch? We talked about that. We said they could put some in there. Mm -hmm. You got carpet there though, so that's the only drawback. <laughs> yeah, <hard>. yeah. <laughs> but the high schools are a little bit easier in some sense too. The elementaries are not. Because right. yeah, that's a good idea. If the cat, I mean, the the parents already have seats. I mean, you, you, you only have the, you only have those at the high school. They haven't got gyms. I mean, well, that, and that's when that we've talked about the gyms as well. Because if if you if you got to bring more kids back, you can't have them all in the classroom and eat. So you're gonna have to split that. So where you can you eat part in the ca cafeteria, part in the class, and then you move to the gym. You'd have to set up a cafeteria in the gym, twenty tables. Are you going to tear that down every day, put it up every day? And what are you going to do about gym class? What are you going to do about uh, athletics when the, when the time comes? So those are conversations we've had about that as well. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Christy. Thank you.
My part of the transportation, I mean, part of the presentation deals with transportation. Um, October the 5th, which was Monday, called the bus drivers in for a meeting. Uh, we divided it into two sections. I, out of 28, 22 drivers were able to attend the meeting and just kept it simple, not about what do you think about the four day schedule? What is your opinion about this? We dealt with transportation and transportation only. And some of the questions, because the bus drivers have posed this, is, is it important for assistance to continue riding the bus to help with mitigation strategies, uh, temperature checks, and so forth? And of course, 81% of the bus drivers said that having assistance on the bus, wonderful, that they wish that they had assistance on the bus all of the time, um, that everything's been going very smoothly. Uh, a few of the bus drivers that answered no said they just kind of felt sorry for some of the assistants riding the bus. They knew that it was probably a burden for them and they were able to handle their bus and so they said no, even though they've been very helpful on the bus. Uh, the second question, is it important for assistants to continue to ride the bus in the afternoon? That was a little more split because we don't take temp temperatures in the afternoon. The children have been in school all day long. The assistants are basically on the bus um, making sure the students keep their mask on. Uh, when a driver is sitting in the seat and he looks in his mirror and, you, and there's a kindergarten student, basically and if they're halfway back you see the top of their head. It's very easy for them to, to uh, kind of um, sit down in the seat and them not to be able to, to see whether their masks are on. So we were a little bit divided. Uh, do you feel comfortable adding more students to your bus route? Uh, of course, you see 81% of the bus drivers said yes, they were comfortable. Um, they basically, they've had no problems on the bus. Um, I asked them, um, uh, we'll go ahead and, uh, for the next slide. They, they were comfortable if we added more and it says, do you have an assistant park at your house or meet you at a site other than the school? And the reason that question was asked of the drivers is if we only have assistance ride in the morning and they park their car at the driver's house, then how are we gonna get them back to their car that's parked at the driver's house or parked off location? So then we would have to add, you know, we would have to use a county car, things like that. So there's a little bit of logistics that go on there. I did ask the bus drivers, what, have, what has been your biggest challenge? Um, and basically they said they've had no challenge other than waking up and remembering if it's A day or B day, <laughs> which we probably all have that challenge. Uh, but they said, honestly, they've had no, no major challenges. Um, I asked them, how are the isolation seats going? And they said on a, uh, only one driver that attended the meeting said they've had one child with a temperature and that was 99 uh, point something and they set them in the seat and um, I think the, uh, the nurse then to recheck the temperature, the temperature had gone down and the student was able to stay at school. But um, of, so that goes to say that the parents are doing a really good job at checking their children and not putting children on the bus with temperatures. So I think from the beginning of school to now, only having one child with a slight temperature is you know, pretty remarkable. Um, the, the major challenge when we talk about how hard transportation has been, basically it's been at the school level of A day and B day and um, dividing the, the children out in the classrooms, you know, dividing them equally with boys and girls, not putting too many, you know, then you have the, the challenge of you have high school students and dealing with a high school schedule and transportation the other day, I think we had a student that was grounded from his car and he had been driving or something and his mother was upset and he's on a B day, but his schedule's A day and he doesn't have a car. So, you know, just things like that, trying to figure it out or adding students that are having difficulty uh, four days. So we've had a, a few challenges, but the bus drivers have been doing a remarkable job because remember we have A day, we have B days, we have CTE students going four day, half days, and we've been getting everyone to and from when, wherever they need to go. So 
and the bus drivers say they really have no problems. The question, you know, what are your challenges? They have no challenges. Um, and but so basically what you see in front of you is if we go to a four day week and everyone comes back, then you see the ridership. Right now, you know, if you, if you take that and basically divide it in half, that's what a, a driver will have on a daily basis. Uh, we have have some of our buses are very low in number. I know that some of the drivers say they pull up at the high school and maybe two or three students get off of the bus. Um, but that's what you see there is what it would be like with a, on a four day week and everyone coming back, the number of students. Um, Dr. Arbogast called Pulaski, I think, for, for me to see, you know, basically that's a diagram that they have of transportation. They load their students. Uh, of course, masks are always worn on the bus. That's part of the mitigation strategies. They load their students from the back, which is what you see the X. Uh, they load all their students from the back to the front, the X's first, and then they start back with the O's. And um, I think right there, there's uh, 31 students on that bus. And so you can take the 31 and you can see our ridership. I think we're basically over uh, maybe nine buses would have more students on the bus than what that bus would have. I think that's 11 seater, but back on one side we have a couple of 14, right? So we do have a couple of buses, I'm not sure how many, that have 14 rows of seats so we would be able to get a few more on there and that doesn't mean that everyone you know if we decide to go back four days a week um, would everybody be on the bus but that just gives you an indication of what a four day everybody coming back four days a week would look like on our school buses does this does this ridership must they include the number of all workers we have now or this, is this now this is what's riding this is what's right. This would, this is, this, well, of course, we said basically our, our survey was basically, I, I think some may refer to it as a wash. It would be basically equal. So I'm just taking the number of A students and B students and adding them together and making a final ridership number that would be coming every day. So this does include the, the kids that are virtual now not being on bus. A virtual kid doesn't ride the bus, right? Right, but I'm just, if, if no. this is... This you, are you saying, does this include the virtual kids that may come back? Correct. No. Okay. No, it doesn't. No, no. this is only including the children that are riding the bus presently. No. Yes. So we had people that decided, well, I'm ready to get back to school. This, this, would, this would be more. There would be more. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But I will tell you that... Um, what would change as far as transportation goes? If we go back to a four-day week, we must, there would be no A day and no B day. It would be, we would be back to driving our regular routes on a daily basis. You know, like right now, you know, you've got, they, they go in one community on A day, one community on B day. It would be every community every day. And it would be up to the child then to know if you're getting on the bus A day or B day because the bus is going to go by your house. If we came back four days, you wouldn't have an A, B day. Correct. Right? Okay. Well, depending on the grade level. Right. If you say, like for instance, if we if uh, we have to, no matter what grade configuration, if you say if you bring pre K through three back, we have to run through every community every day. Okay. There would still be A day A students and B students. But that bus is still going to go by their house every day, so it so it wouldn't matter. It would just be the student getting on the bus on the right day. Vice versa, if high school came back four days and the pre-K didn't. Same thing. They still just, they would need to know if they were AB, which day to get on. They, the bus could come by, and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm missing the bus. Well, never mind. Um, if, ne never mind. I don't go to school today. <laughs> yes, it would, and I would basically it would help our CT. It, you know, running the buses on a daily basis, four days a week, uh, in every community would help with the CTE a little bit. You know, but we're working that out. We've got that worked out. Um, so, um, and basically, and the other thing that we would have to do. Um, I don't really see any way around it. We've been discussing it. Is you know we stop with the transfers, 
um, like a, an Eastern student would get on a different bus and then ride to Giles in a pre-pandemic world. We stopped that, which you know makes the bus routes a little longer. But we said if we go back to driving our regular routes, then there would be a, a child that would be on this bus, would transfer and go to a different school. We would be doing that again. But the child that's doing that would have a mask and not not a temperature because their temperatures would be checked. You know, so it's we're putting we know that that child would be well, you know, would not be running a temperature and would have a mask on and wear a mask the whole time to get on a transfer bus. Leave anything out, no, Christy? Any questions? Well, we're ready to go with transportation, whatever the decision is. The bus drivers, I just want to say the bus drivers have been so good. They have not complained. They, you know, just tell us what you need us to do. We're ready to do it. They've been, they've been wonderful delivering the meals. You know, you couldn't ask for a better bunch of men and women driving our kids. So we're very fortunate. Thank you. Thank you. Not that you need this, but just a, a enrollment update. Uh, as of September 30th, uh, last week, um, you see the enrollment we have. Eastern has uh, 389 students. That was as of last uh, Wednesday, 30th. Has 93 students that are 100% virtual. Macy has 465 and has 113 students, 100% virtual. Narrows Elementary has a total of 472 and 146 virtual. And 100 uh, high schools. There's the high school numbers. Giles High School and Naris High School. Total enrollment as of the 30th, 2,241. We had 672 full time uh, virtual. That's approximately 30%. Um, as of today, just to, to give you a comparison, October 8th, our enroll total enrollment is 2,238. And we have 659 full-time virtual. Our budgeted ADM 2265. 22, 2265. Total down almost 30. Kids. 108,000 bucks. Homeschool enrollment. Yeah. There's your total. Right there. And you see how many. Forty-eight this year alone. Yeah, that's what I said. Cause we were, we were worth about one hundred and fifty last year. They're about one hundred and fifty, one hundred and sixty, <laughs> seventy somewhere in that neighborhood. I don't know what we do about that, but we are offering virtual. We we have if nothing else we can be providing beyond that school system to keep them from going to homeschool. So. These are the children it's, that are having trouble with Canvas. Yeah. The parents don't want to send them back, and the teachers are, and a lot of them have felt like this the best option because they can't manipulate the computers. They can't. So they've chosen homeschool, and what some of them have noticed. Um, I don't need to. Tell you these, you know, you know what our mitigation fact, uh, strategies are: mask, gaiters, uh, face shields, hand sanitizer, six foot physical distancing. Um, something that we're going to need to talk about, or uh, if we're, if when we are bringing more students back, uh, do you feel uh, it is necessary? It is essential to purchase what we're calling. I'm calling them desk shields. I don't know what I, what the better terminology is. Um, that, that right there that, that Christy has. That would be one that would go on the student's desk. That would be Velcro to the desk. It would be there uh, every day when the student comes into the classroom. That one right there is what would be on the teacher's desk. It's a, it's another it's another barrier uh, that would that would be available within the classroom. But not being six feet apart, physical distance, 
I don't believe that that would eliminate the necessity to have a mask. I just, I don't understand. You got some that says three, some says six. What is it? For contact tracing is six, or recommendations, it depends, it's at least three. Yeah, it's three, between three, five, and three to six. So three, six. You know, essentially what they're telling us is any plan that we move forward with where the kids are inside of six feet for more than 15 minutes, mask, shield, whatever, that we are going to have to be okay with the possibility of mass classroom shutdowns and that contact tracing pretty much being a six foot diameter circle drawn around that kid. Every kid. Anybody who touched it, are out for 10 days. Or is it 10, is it 12 now? 10 and then without a temperature? Right. If, yeah. if the start of symptoms is 10 days, positive test. Any contact with that person? So again, they put us in that spot where okay. we well, have to say. I know what I yeah. know all that. It's but, just this. But the, th the three feet, I guess, um, understanding Jesse, go you know, back to that the three foot, uh, three feet is the bare minimum yes. that we can be considered yes. correct safe. Per Dr. Bissell, and, and you know, I think when you're asking who do you follow. It's the local, I mean, it's our local health department is who we have to rely on our locale. So she, we, if we sent in a plan that included anything where kids were inside three feet for more than 15 minutes, she would probably say, thumbs down. I would imagine if it was closer okay. than three feet, she would not agree with that. Okay. I could be wrong. That's okay. just my impression. I'm just trying to get some visual guardrails for us here so you know, yeah. what we can work with that. Yeah, and personally, I mean, I couldn't. I don't think I could go past the American Academy of Pediatrics. No. Yeah. yeah, and they're three and six. Um, survey process. Again, I probably don't need to tell you this. We uh, staff surveys. We had a conversation with principals on September, Monday, September twenty-first, following the board meeting the week before. Um, we we told them we needed to gather information from staff from parents, particularly pre-K through seventh grade, and because we need to share information with you all about the possibility of making changes to the instructional model, uh, the hybrid model of instruction. So what the elementary principal did, they created Google uh, survey, sent it to their stack uh, faculty, and they had responses back to us by Thursday, Friday, uh, September 24th, um, and, you'll, and I'll show those to you here in a moment. Uh, parent surveys, the call went out Friday, September 25th, letting parents know that the uh, parent survey was going to be available um, on Canvas, on their child's Canvas page for pre-K through 7th grade uh, students. Survey was posted uh, Sunday, September 27th. The reminder went out September 30th, and it was actually uh, still available through Friday, October 2nd, last Friday. Information from the schools, the staff survey information. Survey data from Eastern. Basically they had four options that they put out. Option one was pre-K through third students have the opportunity to return to school full time Monday through Thursday. Again, full virtual option available. And, uh, and with the understanding that uh, students would have to wear a mask at all times and fourth grade, fourth through twelfth grade will stay uh, virtual. I mean, excuse me, hybrid or virtual for their current plan. You see that under option one, two people selected that two staff, two staff members. There were a total of fifty responses from Eastern staff. That's about a, that's a ninety six percent response rate. The second option just added two grades, pre K through five. Two staff members were in favor of that. Option three added two more, pre-K through seven. One staff member was in favor of that. Option four, maintain what we currently have. 
And that's the majority, 90% or 45 staff members chose that. So here's the issue I have with this exercise, Dr. Arby asked. When we polled the teachers and all we told them that they had to choose from is just flat out, they're coming in with masks on all the time. Did we expect them to give us any response other than this if we didn't give them a detailed plan of what that would look like? I mean, all they know is, okay, would you like all the kids to come back in the building and have a mask on? I mean, that's what that question says. How are they, how are they supposed to answer any other way? Than there, there's no other way, there, there, there's, there's no other way for us to, to gather the information to be able to provide to you now. It would have been another three, two, three weeks, four weeks at least to allow the principals to sit down and, and devise anything because we need, to, we need to know a grade level. If we don't have a grade level, there's no way to provide, to, to, to set up any plan. I mean, because it would take pre-K through third is going to take enough time to determine what that's going to look like. Then you add two more grade levels, they're going to take time to do that. You add two more, they're going to take time to do that. Well, I, I thought the last work session was really pretty clear that the direction was come up with a plan for pre-k through three four five whatever that number is not and it was left to you guys to decide we're not the experts in education to determine what that break point is and we we're relying on you and the elementary principals and the teachers to decide what's the most effective bang for the buck i mean these surveys every every single elementary school population says no just the flat the answer is no so what we needed to know was if a plan is put together is the breaking point three five six or seven not are you okay with them coming back which one needs to come back so the question is not asking i mean we, we didn't find out what we needed we wanted to know when what the break point was do the teachers feel like K through three needs to be back in the building because they are not getting the education they need. Do the teachers feel like K through four are the ones that need to come back? Not are you comfortable with them coming back? Are they getting instruction that they need? And is that the group that we need to put the plan together for? Right? Right. Is that, that's what we need. Not are you comfortable with it? You're the professional. You're the one dealing with the students. If we only bring K through three back, are we going to save those kids from not being able to read? I mean, I asked some of the Eastern teachers that, and they said, look, fourth on, we feel like the kids can read. We're, we're capturing them. Pre-K through three, I talked to the teachers there. They were like, mm, mm not doing it. And I, that is what I thought we were trying to figure out. That, and I'm... I understand that it's already been done, but just you know, ninety percent of the teachers saying we don't support them being back. I, I don't know what we do with that. But. The ones I spoke with at Macy, they really want the three K to third there, and they want them there. But they want them there in time. They want they want what this survey is saying. With the time is right, they want them there to come first. When's the time right? That's what we have to decide. I believe that's exactly what we're here for. Well, the time, you know, and, what and we're I here. think this is what the, the survey is all about. And, uh, if this survey is wrong, you know, I think it's, I think, you know, this is exactly what they're saying. You know, let's continue with what we're doing right now and let us decide when the, is that the best time. But this doesn't have anything to do. This doesn't have anything to do with the kids. Regardless, regardless of when we go back and we decide to go back to the day week instruction or, or returning everyone or whatever grade level that is, we've got to have a plan. And what I thought I was clear in asking for, I thought Mr. Steele and, and Ms. Glenn understood, was that okay, come up with a plan, K through at least three. Do we need to bring four or five, six, you know, what, what is the most effective thing to do? And that's, that's, you know, and, and again, I don't think, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say, go back to school four days a week until I see a plan. 
I, I can't, I, you know, if, I'm not going to, like you, I'm not going to be able to sleep at night without knowing, okay, we've identified these dangers. Are you willing to accept these risks? Me as a board member sworn in to um, educate our children, but also look after our staff. And so we've got to have that part of it done, you know, by the administration tackling these problems, figuring out, okay, this, these are the, you know, then there'll be some calls we have to make, but you know, the call as to whether it's, it's three, four or five, I mean, it's gotta come from somebody within, with the, with the educational expertise to make that, that call. I agree. And I think that was discussed yesterday. Uh, as I speak to Mr. Mills and Mr. Harvey, yes, I think they're actually working on that. Is that correct? The elementary principals are, going to, are starting to work on that, correct? Starting to work on, on which grade levels they think need to come back or, or a plan. I think it was the to plan. Bring back. They're going to start working on a plan for pre K through third as a starting point. Okay. And again, you don't blame anybody, you blame me. I took I did not take the conversation from the board meeting that, that you all wanted a plan today. We I thought we were charged to give you data so we had an idea of what those grade levels were gonna look like. Well when we discussed this, and I remember it, we discussed all of us discussed pre K through third and maybe staggered. Did we all talk about that? We, we talked about yes, we talked about pre-K and then, then so many weeks later right, incorporate exactly. another group. Mm -hmm. so maybe a couple weeks later or not. Right. 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 That's what, but we all was in agreement that what we were hearing was we've got to get the little ones back in the building. Oh, I agree. We need to, we, we, you to to we got to do that. I, and, I think, and I think before, before the question as to what, I guess that's probably a, Mr. Seals, one of the problems with it, I can see where we're reading that I would have a problem with it as well is before we can make the decision as to the timing we've got to have that and have that plan and it sounds like that's underway which is which is good but we've got to you know address we've got to look at that plan before we can say okay that's going in whatever date that is based on those things I mean how long until the start of the next nine weeks October 28th is the end of the first nine weeks that's, not, that's a Wednesday. So we, we're we not going to be in a position to pull the trigger on anything different, even if we wanted to, by that October 28th date? Is that, would that be your... I, I, I would assume, and I, again, I'm making an assumption, if you wanted to make it a, a change, you wouldn't make a change on a, on a Thursday anyway. All right. So you would make the change the next Monday at the earliest, which would have been November 3rd, 2nd. So how do we have enough time for the elementary principals to have a plan put together, brought before this, before staff first, and then to the board in time for us to make a decision and then them have time to implement that by the November 3rd date? Uh, based on conversation yesterday, they, they do not feel that they do. I thought we just got an email right before this. Mr. Mills committed that he could, they were going to have a plan for us on the 22nd. I, I got it. I thought that was the email that we re received to thank you and saying that they were going to work to try to get something by October 22nd for me. No, I mean, that, that was part of the conversation. They'd have something to present to you all on the 22nd, yes. Um, but I don't know. Again, I have not talked to them today to know whether that's since so however has requested elementary principals will begin working on a plan to reintroduce pre-k through third grade levels back to school and present this plan to you prior to the scheduled meeting on thursday october 22nd right. I, yeah it's going to take several weeks after that i believe well and i think that's you know the, my concern i think our all our concerns was it it seemed early on when we heard this that any, any changes had to be done in nine weeks and I think I think understanding Ms. in a, our group session, Philip and I, I think Miss Mustaine um, explained that that we are not kind of bound by that, at least with this first 
Okay. Anyway, so I think you think that concern because I think you've got the concern yeah. your stuff for second semester. Absolutely. When we were originally we were told that the cleanest plan change implementation would occur if we did it on clean breaks of new grading periods. That makes it easier, but it does it doesn't, doesn't have, have to be. To be that we, we can make arrangements at other times. Because what we I mean and people listening need to understand we're we're balancing staff that are stressed and trying the best they can to do this, teachers, but then across this wall, which I wish it wasn't that way, there's a group of parents and teachers that are on a whole nother island. And the distance between those two islands has become greater. It's not just here in the county, it's nationwide. And it's because of the tremendous amount of pressure that this virus is putting on every community. The parents, and if they, and people want to say it's because they want free childcare, whatever it is, they want to know that we are not stuck in a rut and that we are relentlessly pursuing something that looks more normal and, and getting the, the kids the best education they can. Relentless. That doesn't mean that we're ever okay with complacency or not moving ahead. I can tell you the biggest fear that I hear from them, well, nothing moves fast in the school system, so you guys, I, I knew it was coming. Here comes the second nine weeks, and we're, right, we're still right where we were. At the end of flu season, you'll say, well, that made us really nervous, so we're gonna try to get through until June next year. That's, that's the concern that I hear. I, I believe that we have people that absolutely can make things happen, and we will get better and better but I, we have to constantly be evolving and making sure that we're moving forward if we're not stuck by that nine weeks i'm a lot less concerned but like as i felt like we're like rolling up to this window and <laughs> if we miss it then we got nine we're not we're bound by another nine weeks and we can't do anything inside that even if we want to but if that's not the case is that not the case well, I think you're you're asking the same question over and over again, and when you you're asking what do the educators feel like is the best thing, they're telling you that's the plan we're in right now. So you keep asking the question, and they're going to keep giving you that same answer, and you want a different answer, and they're not going to give it to you. They're going to say this is the best plan. That's what we came up with. But if, if you then if you ask what kids should come back, they're going to say, well, of course, pre K three. Can you do it and social distance? No, I can't. Yeah. So then they are going to want you to say, well, then we're going to make that, we're going to make that decision. They need somebody to say, okay, well, they're coming back and we're willing to take that risk. But if you're going to ask the principals and mm -hmm. the teachers, can you physical distance in your classroom safely and bring your kids back? They're always going to tell you no. Okay. So you and so when you say come up with a plan so you can physical distance, they can't do it. That's what they're saying. So you keep asking that question, they're gonna give you the same answer. My biggest fear my biggest fear, and I said it to the principals yesterday, and the state be heard it, um, is that we we've got we've got it going now. We've we've actually got it moving. There's teaching going on, it's not the best. But kids are being taught, you know, and they're in the classroom, you know, part time or whatever. My biggest fear is, and when we get everybody back, it's going to shut the school system down if their numbers spike. And the worst thing to happen right now is all virtual. We can't go all virtual right now. That's the worst thing in the world to happen. And all our kids will suffer from that. You know, the ones that are going there part time or being educated and they need that, you know, whether it's two days a week, whatever. But it will hurt them to go pure virtual and and I think a lot of the teachers are feeling the same way. Yeah, you know, the teacher that even though it's harder, harder on them. The virtual. That's what I'm hearing the more complaints is it's not so much as the kids coming back as they can't do both. That they don't feel it's like that, on the, the that they don't feel like that they can do both. That's where I. That's what I'm hearing, I, and I think that's maybe that could be an answer why they said that. But they'd rather do what they're doing right now than they'd rather have a schedule right now than anything. I mean, I, I believe I'm hearing from. Well, then we need to. We, we heard from the survey. 
Well, I'll send the survey if we don't want to listen to but, it. But we also heard numerous emails that all of us got as a board yes. saying that hybrid is not sustainable. It's terrible. At the, at, that was the common theme in those. Well, that was we ended with. The that, that was before we said we might go back four days a week. Right. Now, now it's the greatest thing since it's like bread. bread. So, I, hadn't I, mean, heard, I hadn't heard that, but uh, it, it's better than nothing. I believe. Well, I'm not. I'm not satisfied. Better than nothing. I think that is a poor it, it's presentation. Better, it's, to better, it's, better, it's better than gasping for breath. Well, I, and I think so, you know, we, well, Mark, that's a little bit. I don't think so. That's a little bit dramatic. Not if you knew somebody. Well, we don't need to be using scare tactics when we're trying to make good okay. decisions here. And, and, remember that. And, and I think maybe you I may need that one day. Maybe the what I've been talking about when I say I need a plan. I, I guess what I'm saying is okay. We go back pre-K through three. You guys are, are putting together what that's going to look like. So we just need to have identified, okay, these are, you know, I think we've got the generalities and we know what we're dealing with here, that we're going to have serious social distancing issues. We're going to have, you know, things. Let's work through those problems, figure out, okay, this is, better, this is, this is what it's going to look like. These are the problems that really concern you as a superintendent, concern us as a principal have that put before us on October 27th mm -hmm. with that plan or October 22nd that's that's the plan um, here's these other factors and you know at that point then we decide what you know because I'm sitting here I'll tell you right now I said yes I support and I want our kids to go back four days a week but if I see huge issues identified with what's happening if I see our numbers skyrocket all those things I'm not wed to that I want to do what's safe because you know, number one is educating our kids, but we got to protect them too, protect our, our staff. Uh, and you know, it's not, you know, I'm not a, that's why I would never say, okay, you guys, we're going back four days a week without seeing, you know, a plan and full discussion and identification of this is exactly what it's going to look like. But well, this, we have to keep in mind too, that this can all be done and over with if there's an outbreak. I mean, exactly. If we could completely yeah. shut down. Sure. You have to keep in mind that you want to come back, and we all want to, we all want to get it back. But well, there, I, there is a point where it could be like, I mean, the governor could shut us all down. Well, again. what the survey is saying, I think, is what we need. We need to give direction. The survey is saying, and I think Ms. Mustaine did a good job. Or maybe I was saying the same thing over and over. We can't, we can't provide a plan any different than what we're doing right now. If you want us to maintain the six foot. So what we Correct. need to give direction is we would like you to put a plan together for K through three that goes inside of that six feet but doesn't get within three and give us the pros, cons, good, bad. Yeah, and the, at a bare minimum, we need that. Our staff needs that. Right. Every parent in this community needs that for them to make an informed decision of, about what they want to do personally and what we need to do as a system. So is he working? Does he understand that we want to go inside of that six feet, but not inside of three? They will. Okay. The plan that he's working on will. They they will understand that when, okay. we're, when we're done here today. And that doesn't mean everybody listening and the teachers can't be panicking right now. Jason said it. We're not saying that is what we're going to do, but we can sit here all day. We don't have a plan to say. I mean, I think when that plan comes in. If everybody in here does the same thing that they did for us today with that plan and say here, Christy comes up and says, here are the goods and bads that I see with this plan that they put together related to cafeteria and transportation. Jesse, here's what I think good, bad, y'all need to consider based on the health stuff. Then we have to do the tough decision and decide how much we're willing to risk. But until that happens, we're, we're just going to make people unhappy when we have no reason to do this yet. But I think that's what the principals are waiting on us today to make a decision on whether we're going pre-K through three, pre-K pre through four or what. That They need that direction so they can get our plan, their plan going. That's what I understood in the meeting yesterday, right? Right. Mr. Buckley? Right. And, and I think that, again, goes, and I hate to turn the question back on them, but I mean, Dr. Harvey asked, based on your discussions with principal, based on your expertise in this, is pre-K through three, if we we're going to get the most educational benefit for our student, elementary students, is that a cutoff? Three, is it four, is it five? Um, pre-K pre through third, you're going, right now, you're going to get 
that's where they expressed the concerns about reading, et cetera. Right. No, that was what we needed. That is the guidance that was in the first return to learn plan. And that, that's, and that's phase two. That's phase two guidance for us, pre K through it's third. Pre K through third. We could have always had pre K through third back. Yeah. We chose not because of the physical distancing. But the governor says you can bring back. But we, the yes. principals are very concerned about, of course, they're, you know, they're very concerned about the liability themselves, like you guys, you know, within their building and getting people sick. They're very concerned about that. You know, like Mr. Brown, sorry, Dr. Brown at Macy, he already has every classroom, you know, how many, how many children can you have at three feet? How many children can you have at six feet? How many is on your class list? Can you do this? Can you do that? They've already done that, but they need a, they need a narrow scope of where do where do you guys want them to go? Do you want them to go pre K seven? Do you want them to go pre K three? We got to narrow it down so they can have the plan. And I guess we were, and maybe I'm just you know, and so like with transportation, you know, there's nine buses that we will not be able to. Well, there's nine buses that the kids will be over. That's what you know. I told you today. Christy's told you how many people can eat in the lunchroom. If the principals want to alternate it, they can have one school can have 76 on a at one time. So the principals are going to have to work their lunch shifts out. It may take them four hours to eat within a day. So we've got that. It's just like, but they need a narrow scope. And if we're going in the direction of pre-K three, then you know, just like always, they'll make it happen. But they want you to know it's not going to be at six feet ever. Be it won't be. And there will won't be and can't be. Won't be and it can't be because we don't have we just, it, the room, just don't have the room. And so they need you to but tell it, them that's what you want. They'll make it happen. And then everybody understands the board, the principals, the teachers, and the community that we may have to shut some classrooms down because there may be some kids that get sick. Yeah, it's but take some time. I mean, that's what the they need. Elementary mean. pre K. Now, the high school, whenever we decide uh, schedule wise, I, I know for Giles, they can come back at a moment's notice. I think right. they're scheduled. Correct. To, to, tomorrow. Right. Come back. I don't know about that. Nares High, Nares Nares High School Nares is going to be a little. Be, it's going to be a little more challenging. It's going to be challenging. So right. that's why we've said second semester for high school would make would make more sense because that's that's the split. But now Nares, Miss Mustang is the, and Chrissy are the bus routes. Independent of each other between Nares West, High School and Giles High School. Western end travels on the western end. Right. And yeah. So Central if, if those two were on different comeback schedules, the buses wouldn't, that wouldn't make it more complicated, or would it? Unless tech center. You got the tech, center, got the tech kids. center kids. Tech center kids. You got to keep them on the same bus. Okay. You got the tech center. You know, and the other thing we have to take into consideration, too, that, of course, we've all been talking about, you know, December the 5th or 8th or whatever is when we start practicing with sports we're going to have there's going to be more contact with other uh you know with other counties or uh, other divisions you know we worry about that we all wanted to just present the facts to you today just so you you know not try to be one way or the other just to give you the information and not be like pro or or against anything well, just, you've done that well. i'm sorry you've done that well oh. <laughs> But the direction, the direction coming out of here is you, we, we will, I will, K, pre, uh, principals will know the plan, they, they need to develop a plan pre K third grade that keeps physical distancing at least three feet. Yeah. Ideally, and need the pros, and need the pros and, and cons. Uh, yeah. You're not gonna get, you, know, you won't get six feet. I mean, six are gonna come back so, and say you already got it. You, you've got it right now. So you, you, yeah. you're, not, you're not gonna get it if you're bringing more kids back. So you've got it now, so it's gonna have to be at three feet at least. When do we engage the high school principals and let them know that there is a chance? Started that this morning. I already told them that this morning that they better be thinking about it because I can't couldn't get, uh, figure out or determine what you all are going to tell us today. Okay. So they better they need to be thinking about what uh, what that return to learn would look like for them. Would it, would it be helpful to other board members if they came and explained to us what they thought would be a phasing a phasing plan that would work or do we, for them, or do we need to get the rest of the primary students for, I mean, I, I don't know. I just don't want to be wasting people's times with meetings upon meetings about theoretical stuff when we've got concrete issues. I mean, I think, I think you've almost got to do, you, 
it just conceptually to me, you and I, I ask all these people to weigh in on this because, because I want to be most efficient with your time so you're not wasting it in meetings, you know, with us. Um, not that you're waiting. <laughs> you understand what I mean. Um, we would never feel that. But <laughs> I'm the only person in my life that said that. <laughs> but is it going to be easier to plan incrementally the next, you know, Regardless of whether we implement this or not, we at some point are going to go back to school, so we've got to get phased in um, all the way up to grade 12. But would it be simpler to do pre-K through th th to three and then start looking at, okay, what's next grade level to four, five. Four, five, yeah, yeah. Six, seven, six, seven, seven, high school. And then high school. Okay. That's, 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 what we've, that's what we've talked about, and that would be the most logical, I would think. As long as the high school knows that at some point, I don't, I'm not saying that they waste any of their time at this point, but they know their okay. buildings, and they probably in the back of their mind are already starting to think, okay, what what would work best for us, and what challenges do I have? And so no formal plan, but just so that the wheels are turning, and, and we're not starting from scratch at ground zero. When we finally do get to them, they're like, hey, we've been thinking about this. We've seen it coming. So they, we were phasing grades in for us. We they were, were they were told that to okay. start that thought process today. So Lisa, and when we're working on this on the K through three and start out with the principals, is there like an option that they can still talk about some maybe one of the in the class each of the grades doing a virtual because that's still what I'm hearing. Yes. It is yes. we can't do it both. Right. You know, it's that two be, days for right. I think that's a big that's right. a big factor with the teachers of one exactly. reason why they're saying keep it like it is because they don't know how to right. do, they don't know how to manage the hybrid and the virtual. Right. And that's why they're saying we don't want to come back four days. I feel like a lot of them, that is the reason. Yes. And how are we going to fix that? Yeah, we were discussing that. And, um, you know, of course, if we could have, you know, if we knew then what we know now, we would have had like a virtual teacher. We didn't understand all of what was going to happen. I mean, that's basically the key, in my opinion, is if we could get a teacher to teach children virtually at the elementary school. I don't know how it would work at the upper grades because those teachers are specialized. I don't know how it happened. Yes. But, you know, we can talk about that. Can make it is easier. And, and, you know, so depending on the number of children that would come back four days a week, having a, having a teacher per grade level that could check on these children, that could, you know, on a daily basis, have live feeds, and not just a Friday. It would take a lot of stress, off, of stress off of the teachers. But it's something to better check into, like we said before. This is not one way it's going to be around for a while. Right. Not just this year, probably next few years. No, how much, do you know how much CARES Act money we have left? Yeah, we just got a notification today that we're going to get another $396,000. I, I don't know about you guys, but I'm thinking, yeah. and when, when does that, if we would hire just theoretically a virtual teacher, or I hate to say the virtual teacher, a teacher to teach virtually, um, so yeah. <laughs> I would do it. <laughs> but, but say we do that, uh, you know, and of course that's going to obligate us, you know, term of the contract. Is that is that money that's committed, or is that money that had to be expended by December thirty first, or, or is the money, time frame extended? Or? Money that we were notified today. Again, we have not received anything officially, but uh, except that we were, that we were awarded it. Uh, had, I believe it has to be spent by. Uh, Allocated and spent by November 30th. The other CARES money that you're referring to, we have through September of 2022. 2022. Okay. So we would have, we potentially would have enough money to pay for a teacher to teach virtual for more than one. We, we would be able to get through the, the year with that CARES Act money if we chose to use it for that, but just one, one time. It's possible. You may be able to absorb it too. Like if you have yeah. grade levels with four teachers and you divide your kids by three, one teacher could be the virtual teacher. Yeah. And you have your kids divided three ways instead of four, depending on the number. That may not work at But that would level. be up to the principals that's, to tell us. That's, 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 that's part of their plan. That's part of their plan. Yes. 
And you yes. have to release the stress off of it. Too. Yes. 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 Please do. Yes. yes. Because I mean, I and I, I mean, know that is yeah. real. I mean, they are really struggling with that. I mean, I think I think ideally, you know, if we can do it with existing teachers and, and take load off of somebody, if somebody wants right. to do that, we do that. But then I think you know, we get to the high school level, you know. We're just going to have to look at uh, really look at that because I think I'm I would strongly I think everyone else here strongly support the use of that money yes. to take that virtual load off of. I think that's the number one. It's going to be the number one issue with us phasing kids back in because mm -hmm. if we don't take the virtual pressure off every time we add another kid to that classroom, that just Correct. piles on right. to what they're already doing. Okay. And at that point, they're already going to be worn way down because we're way up in the year. I, <clears throat> and we've got I think it. it'll make a difference with them, knowing mm -hmm. that we're going to get them some help with that. I think it'll change of getting like wanting more kids in the building four days a week. Yeah. If we can relieve some of that mm -hmm. stress of the virtual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, to me, honestly, what I hear the principal say, it, the big thing is, you know, is the space. Mr. Steele said you can't make the room bigger. You can't make the school bigger when you bring more kids back. Well, you could. You can? I don't think we have that much care. Okay. But it, it's not the time to talk about that. No, no let's, let's do one argument. As the virtual classroom, but anyway, yeah. and, okay. and one, but anyway, it's being ready to get off the rails. <laughs> well, no, that's not, I ain't talking about this all that. I'm talking about just being the virtual teacher, you know, but well, the virtual so teacher is like, still going to have to be there. They're going to have to room. A, a place right. to video herself. Yeah, but yeah, he's so. a teacher. Yeah. I don't know. We can just. Yeah. 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 I think the principal administrators have we'll to be the experts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They have we'll to talk the experts. About. But what I'm saying, they just, I mean, really, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for guidance. Is it going to be pre K 3? Is it going to be pre K 5? What is it going to be? Well, we thought that that would be up to them. That was when we had our work session. We thought that they would know. Right, you know, being in the yeah. buildings, you know, who needed to be. They know who needs to be there, but when you're asking them if they feel like it's the right time to bring them back, they're going to tell you no. So we're just going to have to say this. That's is right. That's right. That's what we're going to They're always going so, to say. Yeah. Oh, great level. We, so, well, I think with Mr. Like Mills' email, I think it's pretty much K through three. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. K through three. Yeah. Why don't we add to that? Such an email. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay to be okay to do no closer than three feet and a serious consideration for what virtual teachers added to that plan would look like to, yeah. to make it really feasible. So if we sent a survey out, oh, okay. I think that plan let's go send a survey. Yeah, I'm just saying if that we'll survey was more surveys. I, that survey was no. sent out that said, no. No. and the survey said, no. 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 Well, I, I think, but I think honestly, this will this be the this should be the easiest group K through three yes. to be able to do no, pick no, out no, versions yes. before, and then I think they should be all the principals should be eyeing. Okay, we should get the higher grade levels. Of course, the most effective use of our funds to get virtual. That yes. and that's and that's what yeah. we to, we told them yesterday when they left. Yeah, and I don't think the, the, the question meant to be a trick question or try to sway anybody one way or the other. It's just what we're saying is we're doing all the mitigation strategies that we can possibly do. But when we're bringing kids back in, everybody needs to understand they're going to wear a mask more. That was what. And so if we wanted to ask the parents, you know, you know, you know, don't want to, you know, you can't jump in and out. Your child's going to be wearing a mask longer throughout the day because of the physical distancing. And everybody wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that. And I mean, because we are, because we're already doing everything else, we're cleaning, we've got all the protective gear. So, I mean, that was the meaning of that question. Okay. Yeah. Like we got a yeah. yeah. I've got one question because I, I do think. This is unrelated to the plan, but kind of related to some of the stuff we're talking about, some of the stuff about the third world country that Stevie's talking about, <laughs> whatever that was, whatever county. Um, <laughs> Where you eat outside when it's 15 below zero. Well, well no, but, but let's think sad. about this. If we do have funds, and I know that circuit court judge here had um, and his plan for Blaine County's uh, jury plan. They had to come up with plans because you got a social distance with the jury plans and, and things like that. Um, one of his plans there, I think, was to submit uh, or put in a heated tent 
outside so that you can get the social distancing. Shouldn't we be looking, especially with this weather changing? And if we've got these issues, we've got some space. I know we got, you know, we're going to have space issues at Nairs Elementary, um, Nairs High School. Well, maybe not. Maybe you use the front lawns um, and get some tents, get some heat system, get some clothes. Let's look at that. Because, I mean, you're thinking I, they can't be that expensive compared to, you know, constructing a building or things like that. I mean, I, we, and if we've got those funds, you know, those tents are going to be something that, that will last. They're not ideal. You know, that, that would I, if you'd ask me, are you going know, to send my two boys or going to school Nairs Elementary out into a tent in the middle of winter that's heated and it's going to be drafty? Uh, in a normal year, I might look at you kind of cross-eyed. But this year, if it gets them back in school and provides some social distancing alleviation, we need to be looking for that. And I think county, uh, you know, that's, that's something that I think they'd be supportive of. Because you know, you know we've got because we're going to have some building code issues and everything else, but I think that's something we got to look at. Because no, Doctor Workman's doing, he's doing that in Black County administrator. So they're they may even have some pricing and maybe have well, navigated that whole permitting and uh, yeah, put on building code right. situation they? at the same time. So well, you put it in between the fences. I don't know how much room that is, how big they are. So can you like kind of, I mean, not now, but send us like kind of what we've been, what we've done with our CARES money and I mean, what we're kind of using it for? I, I don't know that we've spent much of our CARES money. The majority of the CARES money we spent has gone to the county and the county spent their CARES money. Okay. So, but that would be yeah, it's that been would some. Be it's not been, that we would purchase with our cares money. We we shows. had we had some salaries. We we could use salaries out of ours. Okay. Not, we, they, the hazard pay that's come out of ours. Okay. But so we really we would be not, able to purchase something like that. We're like okay what? With, like the like the dance yeah. Sites. Those those things would be. Yeah, that's that's why we're talking about those. Yeah, that okay, would be able to purchase out of that. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's a mitigation factor or any other. Okay. What we got next? But is, if you buy them, it's still not going to get you Six feet. out of the three foot thing. Is it worth much spending the money? For them? That's that's yeah. That's, that's the question. It's, it's it's another it's another layer. That's what it is. It's another barrier. Is it but is it is it worth the money? I mean, I but related to the contact. The only thing that's going to protect Chrissy said is projectile volatility. That's, well, that's, that's, in that's in the cafeteria. That's in the cafeteria. But, I mean, even if we had them in the cafeteria, or, or food, which, they, yeah. essentially we'd have to say, is it worth buying those because we think it doesn't, it's not going to impact the contact, but it is essentially going to provide a safer environment to prevent the... It would. The, it would. Another thing about these, or the ones from cafeteria tables, is you could keep those forever. So, like, if it's if we get through COVID and we get better, and then flu season comes two years from now, teachers can pull these back out and use them again. I mean, it is an added layer of protection. It's not 100. percent It's just an added layer. But I think you know a lot of parents that would make them feel better. I think it would yes. make a lot of the teachers feel better. Correct. And how many times have you been to a cafeteria? Grade school where you got food scattered everywhere with a that's pretty tough Dang. environment there. I love it. You said there's a two week turnaround on on those, Christy. Right now there is. Um, she said if if we let her know today to place the order, it would be here within two weeks. But if they get a bigger yeah. order ahead of us, then we get bumped back. So does the county show any interest in? Myself, I told him that uh, I would let him know what conversation was today. Okay. And I don't want to keep going back to that bucket, but they have been very good to us. And if they, it may be helpful to say, look, in addition to this, at the work session, we have, we're really starting to think hard about other things we might spend our money on, such as the, I don't know if we, is everybody comfortable with Dr. Arbogast's mention of the tent? idea as something we may consider. I don't know. Probably need to check with the fire marshal. Yeah. 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 To make sure that they would 
Yeah, I don't know whether what they, what they say with, with putting kids in there on the school property. I don't know. Okay, I mean, the space sounds like it's going to be a... You could probably I mean, you eat, eat in them. them. You can't instruct them. They have to be Cause, sprinkled. Because they wouldn't be sprinkled. You know, we talked about going back to the annex at one point years ago, and we couldn't do that because it wasn't sprinkled. But you could eat. We could, we could use a little leave in a cafeteria. But we couldn't instruct there. That was years ago. Yeah, I'd, we'd, have, we'd have to ask the question, and I, we'd have to ask. What about gym? Could they do some okay. exercise in I don't know. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. We'd, we'd have to ask the question to see what the fire marshal would tell us. Okay. So we need to have her order these? Are we leaning in that direction right, right now? <clears throat> you say it was 60000 65, 66000 2400 of them, and that was for every student, and then 350 for the teacher ones, and then all the adhesive tape to go on the desk was right at 65000 65, 66000 somewhere in there. Is that a virtual teacher? $65,000? A teacher that would teach virtually? That's why I'm trying to compare what we would do with that money, either or. If you're going to hire a teacher, it's going to start out at 36000 something plus benefits. You're up to 40000 dollars 50000 As a parent, would you feel comfortable? Would, you, would that make you feel more comfortable? I'm just not putting it. Would that make you feel more comfortable if you were going to send your kids four days a week to have something like that on your desk, Jesse? I mean, you, I mean, there's no wrong or right answer. I mean, just I you know, know too much, Jesse. You yeah, I know too much, so my answer is no. <laughs> Amanda's this yes. way is good. This way is not. Uh, yeah. you know. I think you have some. Like we, I've talked to different ones. Some say. They don't want their kids to feel like they're boxed in, you know, like maybe it's too confining. Other people say, yeah, that makes me feel a lot better. You know, no one's going to turn around and sneeze on me. So it's it's just a mixture. You know, you're never going to please everybody. I like actually like the cafeteria dividers a lot better just because I've done so much lunch duty and people touching food and this and that. I mean, I like the cafeteria tables dividers better than the yeah, desk dividers. Quite that works. sixty-five thousand yeah. did not include the cafeteria. Yeah, that did not. That didn't touch the cafeteria. Fifty dollars a table, mm -hmm. a a six-foot table, Somebody not really a twelve-foot table. Well, do we need to buy but more? If you're eating in your room, right. Then you don't need or would you want to just do pre K three? That's what I'm do we need to just I mean, kind of if if we're all pedal into it. If we're only gonna go pre K through third at the time, then you you, you could only order part of them now. Yes. So my fear is what if we buy sixty thousand dollars worth of dividers and then we don't even need them in the secondary because we don't phase back in until after a virus uh, a vaccine's in and everything starts dying back down. They lift the guidelines, and now we got a warehouse full of sixty thousand dollars worth of dividers. Man, then, then you are putting you, back in the building now. It's K through pre K through three. You, you keep you keep you keep uh, the, divi the dividers. Are yeah, start off with. Let's do let's do that. I mean, I, I think I'll get, get rid of more. I mean, I continue to use yesterday. I got concerned when I learned that it wasn't going to affect our ability of considering social distancing. Um, but I do. I also want to make sure you know that the teachers that for their desk that you know if they feel comfortable, it makes them feel more comfortable with it. Then we need to get those. But definitely no more than pre K through. Three to start with, right? Yeah, so. I mean, there's not any economy. We're not getting like a special discount for buying. It was like a dollar cheap. Dollar total? Dollar each. 99 cents plus one penny? Oh, each. Each. They're 24 dollars. Each. Okay. It's like 24. It's 24 bucks, and that was pretty, that would have been. So how long do we need for K through three? Uh, well, we, we shouldn't have that question. Do you mind? 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 Do About just over 600. Is that about right? Pre-K three. So then, Jesse, if we have on pre-K three, and we have, we try to get as much space between the rows, that that would help transmission if they put the desks back to front, right or no? 
Then they would, they'd be within three feet. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you're going to be within three. Yeah. So that, that, that doesn't help us put desks right against each other, period. You're back within <coughs> three feet. <laughs> So are they just making people feel better? I'm speaking, I'm speaking for myself. It's a great idea, but my opinion is I think we would be better off spending our money for our teachers that can teach virtual. That's just my opinion. And I understand. I understand they're, they're good, but... What if we just got... How much the teacher, teacher ones have? I mean, I think... Um, I think they were five dollars more. Yeah. Oh yeah. Would y'all feel more comfortable? I'm with you. I mean, you heard me yesterday when I found that out. I don't. It's more of a psychological thing. But if our teachers, I, I feel like we should at least spend the money on the teachers if they want it. Maybe poll the teachers see who we want. Yeah, they want uh, one. Yeah, I mean, if they want one, they can get one, and then. We purchased that because I don't think, again, I don't think you're doing anything. Jesse shaking her head there. I agree. I agree. But if it makes if it makes any teacher feel more comfortable with that, then just I'm trying to think what a classroom looks like with all those K through three kids and those panels. It looks sad. It looks well that, and they're going to get pushed over, and they're going to be. Drawing on, on, on them, and if they're for the teachers going to be like, all right, take those off. Get rid of those. <laughs> it's driving me crazy. And then. I mean, that's a good possibility. They're going to write on them. They're going to cut kids' corrugated paper. Corrugated, that's possible. They're going to do those things, yes. It's possible. I hate my kindergartners at home. Long tables and round tables, right? <laughs> Some of them. Some of them. So, I guess you could still. So, teacher. <laughs> Teachers well, only teacher for right now. Ask the teachers if they want and pay pay for them if they want. Yeah. One for their debts. Yeah. Where we're, I think so. All right. What about just pre theory? just pre K through third? Or are we polling all teachers and getting them for any teacher? When you ask that question for a reason, Doctor Overgas, so do you think we should offer to all? Teachers, I don't want to try to do a good thing, and then it looks like we didn't think about all of our teachers. Well, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna do it for some, you're gonna do it for all. I think. I think so. Okay. I think if you're gonna do it for a few, you need to do it for all of them. Okay. All right. <laughs> Cafeteria dividers. Any discussion on giving direction on those? Fifty dollars a table. How much is that? Oh gosh. One school has 48 tables. So, I mean, at one school alone, it would be $7,200. Christy, you and Jess, you're experts on, is that going to be a good thing for above? I mean, right now, pre K 3, if they eat in the cafeteria, they're six feet apart. Right. We don't need to do that yet. You wouldn't have to do it yet. Okay. I was just showing you options I mean, that could be looked at if you wanted to. Oh, we would better off, be better off spending, I mean, I think if you're using auditoriums, gymnasiums, everything else, that's a better, it's not spending any money, that's just mm -hmm. moving around the space we've got. Save that for virtual <laughs> teachers. teachers. Or you may need tables and chairs. You may need tables and chairs. Table, like those rubber main tables or something, you know, you might need some of those. We can buy a lot of cafeteria tables for $7,000. Mm -hmm. uh, one. One. <laughs> no, they're, one. Not, they're not. They're not. Cheap. <laughs> no, they're not. They're not cheap. The twelve seed of the gym yeah. on that slide is seven thousand dollars. No, no, it's it's about two thousand. Good. I mean, it's, it's they're made, I mean, they're really nice. Yeah, yeah. I know. I just that is wow. To dividers, to all teachers, no desk, individual yet. No cafeteria dividers yet. Everybody good with that? All right. Is that is that clear on that part, Dr. Right, Argus? Yeah, I got it.
and I don't know based on the conversation that you want to go how much of this you want to go through so I'll go I'll, I'll you you've got the data for Macy you've got the data from Arizona elementary now I don't know what you mean parent survey we talked about yesterday you all already heard that as well so, I can I can give you I can give, I mean, I can give it to you different ways so you can if you want. Let me let me ask this let me ask this question, Doctor I guess. If you once we have a once we have a plan for K through three and we can tell parents what that's gonna look like and how we're gonna handle everything and the risk is gonna be involved. Would that data that you got from the parents be different if we had more details on how we were gonna mitigate risk and everything or would it I don't know if it would or not. No, no sir. Uh, I get I get it. Uh, I'm just saying I don't know if, if people knew there were there's no detail in that survey other than if we send them back you and wear a mask every day, would you, would you send your kid? Not, well, we're gonna have this in place to make sure we're safe as we can be for in class, is that a eat? I mean, they're, they're, I they're, right now, they're six feet apart, they're having them wash their hands, they're doing the hygiene, right. they're, they're separating the cafeteria. We bring more kids, they're not gonna be six feet apart. Right. They're gonna wash their hands, they're gonna do the hygiene, they're gonna have to figure. We're gonna have to figure out a way to separate them in the classroom and cafeteria, into the gym, wherever, wherever, wherever to eat. Mm -hmm. So, really, it, it's it's still, it's still gonna be the same mitigation factors, except they're gonna be three feet closer. Closer. Yeah. I just don't want us to have this plan figured out based on how many forty-six kids say they aren't coming back and then all of a sudden because the plan looks really tight they don't come back well on, on the other end is is it, is it going to be fluid enough that if 40 get thrown into your plan can we just absorb those with the plan that we put together i guess that's that's it's the, a, do, that's do, where do, 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 you give them more information it's going to look more dark and, and like you know it's almost like you no. have to come back and you can't eat in the cafeteria. You gotta wear your mask all day. You're gonna be eating outside with your umbrella. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
because of the low cap because I don't know I'm looking at because I'm looking at that map down there at the bottom and it's are the other localities using this the, Pulaski it, what, what I have what we have right here is what Pulaski's using that right now to, to go back to school and that's what I the, they took the lowest risk and assigned one point lower risk two points and they went up up the, as you went up in higher risk they looked at that for their what you can do is we can look at Giles County for today we can look at it yesterday we could pick a day a week every Monday we would look at the CDC information to see what the data is telling us and how it's progressing and you get basically what you with the three indicators you look at it I and mean, you can look at it for for us that's what we that's what we already did still on jobs and that's going to check me back i got to go back to jobs in indicator one we're moderate so you can assign that three points for indicator one based on based on this right here it would have three points so we'd work, work down this, this, the form here indicator one we put three points there indicator two is dark green so that would only be one point so we would fill in one point one point right here and then we would look at the third indicator our ability to implement the five key mitigation strategies that's the consistent and correct use of masks social distancing to the largest extent possible hand hygiene cleaning and disinfecting and contact tracing currently we can say we're meeting all five of these correctly and consistently So that would be the lowest one point. So we have three points for the first indicator, one point for the second, one point for the third. You add them up, five divided by three, it's one point six. Then you can you, you can we could develop a chart that says if we're between this and this, that can help guide the direction we go. That's, I mean, that, you ask if somebody's using it, Pulaski yeah, is using this. You may learn a lot from Pulaski. And if you are curious, I don't know if I have it, I have it here somewhere. I thought, if you're curious what that looks like for Giles County, those three indicators averaged, so that's starting July 20, 20th, every Monday, coming forward. You don't have that. I, I don't have it in there. So you see, if you average the three, it's 1.3 on, on back in July. Move to the next week with 1.67. Uh, uh, six, uh, then went to two, two, then up to 2.67, 2.67 stayed there, then up to three, and now it's starting starting to work back down. The average of those three indicators. So your thought is we would have some kind of a matrix that we punch in that score and it tells us what we do. You can you can you can use that. You can use it every week. You can look at it every week and say this is what we're going to do next week, or you can use it and say we're going to look at it. This is what we're going to do two weeks from now, or three weeks from now. I mean, the only fear I have with that, locking into that, is what I was saying earlier. If our kids are safer in the building, then do we necessarily want to lock in to following what's happening in the community? If the community's not being smart and they're not being safe, do we let them dictate how we operate the school? I mean, I can see it going both ways. It's, so. It goes both ways. But, but, again, but the reason I share this with you is because the conversation you had and it was quite a lot of conversation about the, what data are you going to use to help you make some decisions. That's that's the reason I wanted to share it. 
I think there will be a group of people in the community that would expect us to have something in a file that says, how are you all evaluating the state of the pandemic? Instead of just saying what we feel. We feel this, we feel that. So, I mean, I think no matter what, we probably need to have something like this. I don't know what the group about. I don't know. But, so, and, and, but keep in mind, as we add more students back, you won't be able to say this. So you're going to move, at least in this one indicator, you're going to move down because you're not going to be able to, to do all five consistently and correctly. We may be able to do all five correctly, but inconsistently. But if we're not, do, if we know we're going to three feet, so physical distancing and not six feet, you're going to move to this moderate, most likely. Because you will be able to do three or four of them correctly and consistently. And you'll be doing four of them correctly and consistently. The, the physical distancing will be the one that will not be done consistently. And again, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's information that can be used. If you want. That's all. That's all I had. Thank you. Do you feel like staff, anybody in here needs any additional direction from us or anything? So we're trying to have ready for the 20 seconds. Dr. Arias, you feel like you got everything you need? I, I will communicate with the elementary principal before I leave today. Uh, they need to they need to continue to work on that plan for pre-k through third grade that keeps physical distancing at least three feet uh, three feet but they need to provide pros and cons and they need to they need to consider everything when they're doing the pros and cons they need to think about the number of students that would be returning making one teacher into in a grade level uh possibly a, a responsible for virtual learning whatever whatever uh, they think we may need to consider for the CARES money, but they need to make sure that's included. I uh, will even put a guardrail of one. If they think, what, what virtual teaching... That's why I said one teacher per need. grade level. Okay. I said yeah. per grade okay. level. Okay. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll find out information about the 10 systems for school, the, the schools with heat systems in them to see what we can do. We'll ask, I'll ask John Mills to see what, what that sounds like, what that looks like. Uh, we will put a poll out to all the principals and or send an email out to all the principals and ask them to check with their teachers to see which ones of them would like to have one of those desk dividers for their desk and then we'll, we'll order those and use the care of money for that. I don't know, need, uh, did I miss anything that... We need to set a time to, to meet with some level of staff on the 22nd, is that... Meeting, we need to call Dr. Arbogast if we're all going to be in the room based on Mr. Mills' email. <coughs> Something about I will be ready to present a plan. All right, you're getting the pride. I just scanned the email here, so I don't know what was in the email. Is that at the regular meeting? I guess that is all right, so the, the 22nd is our regular meeting. Okay, so he plans on doing it then. That what? I think it's going to us. I think my understanding is going to try to get to us before, before then. Before the meeting on twenty second. A day or two before at least, and then, and then so we discuss, discuss it. it. Yes. So we need to have a call meeting for that. Is that the agenda? I think you add it to the agenda for the twenty second, and if you if you want uh, them to be there to answer questions, then we ask them to be there to answer questions. And that would, then that would be the first thing on the agenda uh, okay. following the, the end of the board of session, meeting the session. I have 
Anything else before uh, the DEA has submitted something that they said they would like me to share before we end the meeting? Let me see if I can get us back on the camera before. Okay. Thanks to all of the school system staff that have been sitting here for three hours and one minute. This is the current timeline. You guys are critical to everything we're doing and what we're doing moving forward. So, lots of time already spent by every one of you. Thank you so much for, for everything. Before I end, I mentioned that we had had. Um, letter submitted from GEA, request that we, we read that as we continue to try to make decisions. Good morning. We would like to take the opportunity to encourage each and every one of you at this, at this time. We know that decisions we made moving forward are inevitably difficult. The Jobs Education Association has been working closely with the Virginia Education Association and our general relations office, Kathy Burke. BEA has released the following statement. The Virginia Education Association's first priority during the pandemic has been the health and safety of students, their families, and educators. We are grateful that the leaders of our Commonwealth have consistently based their decisions on science. While we believe that the dashboard is a good tool to help guide local decisions, we are concerned that if that leads to a rush to return to face-to-face -face instruction, that will potentially put students and our members at risk. We are all local school divisions to work with their local health departments and their local education associations to make decisions that keep us all safe. The Child Education Association has delivered survey results of their members and their expertise in the possible transitions to come. We have shared the concerns and comments from our members to you as you should have received those results in an email sent prior to this meeting. We ask that you read one, that you read each one as you develop any plans moving forward. As for the CDC school metrics, the ability of the schools to implement five key mitigation strategies is a core indicator and the risks involved in school reopenings. Consistent and correct usage of masks, social distancing to the largest possible extent, hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette, cleaning and disinfection, and contact tracing in collaboration with the local health department must all be implemented correctly and effectively. We ask you to question whether each of these are possible with full reopenings. What measures have we put in place to ensure the safety of our students and staff while continuing to deliver a substantial education? We are beyond proud of the work each teacher and staff member has been doing in navigating this new and challenging school year. Employees have poured everything that they have into their students and will continue to do so. The amount of workload placed upon educators this year is overwhelming. We request that any changes must you may be done in careful consideration of safety and health, as well as the ability to transition. Employees need time to plan for students, and sufficiently time simply was not given at the start of the school year to prepare fully for students. The Giles Education Association requests that you listen to the concerns and comments of the educators of Giles County Public Schools. We offer sincerity and encouragement during these challenging times. Sincerely, Katie Wright, GEA President. We had to wait until after a discussion to read that because clearly we have had a great deal of discussion about paying attention to everything she talked about when we put the plan together and decide what that looks like moving ahead. Anybody have anything else before we end our session? Thank you guys for work you've done and getting this together. Yes, thank you very much. We need a motion to close. It's not a voting session. We can adjourn it. No, I don't know. Oh. Get everything on the agenda. I haven't seen the agenda. Mm -hmm. Well, we all, we still reserve the right for every work session if we need to do a closed session. Okay. For personnel matters, is any work session do we need? Do we have any personnel matters we want to discuss? Uh, no.
couple of questions about some. Okay, about the all of this challenge and timing line. <clears throat> so, with that, I think the folks on the line probably need to be made aware we're going to go in a closed session to discuss personnel matters. This portion of the meeting will not be broadcast to the public in order to protect the privacy of the personnel being discussed. The closed session will be conducted pursuant to Virginia Code 2.2 371. I make a motion that we go in the closed session. You got a motion? Second. And a second? A motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 